welcome one and all. It's time for a tournament report in the old world. So, this is technically the second Warhammer Fantasy tournament I've ever been to in my life. The first one was Warhammer Fantasy 8th edition, and that was a good nine years ago. So, Warhammer the Old World puts fantasy back on the menu in the Old World, and the Dwarves are here to play. So, let's have a look at my army. This event was Square Based GT3. So, technically, there have been other tournaments going on. I just didn't attend those ones. So, 2,000 points, TSN Arena in Nottingham, and look at that. Beautiful dwarven goodness. Now, there is a slight issue with the list building that I had for this event because I was using Old World Builder app. So there seems to be a battle for supremacy between Old World Builder and New Recruit to see which one is the best. And they both do have some positives and negatives. Old World Builder seems to have a very easy way of calculating your uh, losses after the game. How much stuff that was killed in your army. But the one issue with it is that when you're building your list, sometimes the errors in your list building aren't shown to you and you're not told that your list is actually illegal. So for the first day of this event, I was actually using an illegal list. Bum bum bum. Because these rangers that you'll see here, I had them as two units and I was using them both in my army's core and you're only supposed to have one unit of rangers as a core choice. So for day two, I just mashed them together into one unit. So that's perfectly legal. And we'll see whether they perform well in their illegal form or whether they perform better as one massive 27 unit of rangers. So let's go through my list first of all. If you've been following any of my practice games, you'll know that I've tested out a variety of different war machines, different combos. And what I've settled on for this event is the double organ gun with the anvil as kind of the center of the army and then everything else is built around that. So the anvil, I find it quite important actually, especially for running things like hammerers because occasionally you'll want to get their armor save higher. You also, if you're running a, a ranged list, it just gives you a little bit more ranged power as well. And I don't want to be moving too much. So if the enemy wizards are staying far back, I can't be chasing them down. So I want to draw them towards me, and what better way to do that than with a gun line? So loads of guns, anvil, good complement to that. Guarding the war machines, we have an engineer with a handgun, so he can actually help out with a bit of shooting, and a dragon slayer, who may guard the war machines sometimes, other times he may just run off on his own, bearing his butt cheeks and looking for a glorious, a glorious death, hopefully killing a monster and not just being shot with a crossbow. So... Uh, the anvil, I've actually given it some upgrades as well to make it even more outrageously expensive. So, the anvil has been given... Let me crack open my list here. So I've put three runes on it. So the Master Rune of Balance. So once per turn, I can use an extra d6 when making a wizardly dispel. And discard the lowest result. I don't know if I actually read that part of it before. But that's still good discard the lowest result. Then, yeah, I was definitely doing that wrong in my practice game. I was just using three dice. So it's very important to read all the way to the end of the rules here. And if you're going to see lots of rules played incorrectly at this event, I'm sure. It's still early days for this game. It's a very complicated rule set. Lots of bizarre situations that do come up in this event. You'll see units teleporting around the battlefield but because of bizarre placement reasons. You'll see units that could teleport but can't because of certain bizarre situations that come up. Just look forward to it and then we can all look through the rule book later together and see if we can find an answer. And if we can't, we'll just have to wait for an FAQ. So, two runes of spell breaking as well on the anvil. So two auto dispels with no roll required. And it's only one use though. So two of those given to the anvil. We've also got in terms of heroes, we have a Thane BSB, who's currently in there with the hammerers, as you can see. 
and the Thane has been given the Master Rune of Grugni, which gives a 5 plus ward save to the unit carrying the standard, and also a 6 plus ward save in the shooting phase to any units within 6 inches of the model. So, if I put the hammerers on one side of my army and put the Thane close to the other part of my army, he can then broadcast that 6 plus ward against shooting to other units. So that just seemed like a really good choice, particularly on hammerers who only have really feeble armor, so they could do with the ward save. And they're going to be a, a, probably an obvious target as well, since they're the only major real fighting unit, at least until day two when I am forced to bundle all my rangers together into one unit. Then we've got five dwarf warriors back there who are a very cheap 40 point little screening unit basically if they need to stand in front of a war machine so it can't be charged or if they need to run out there to block something off that's their plan no real major complication with them that's all they are just a bit of a screen and any dwarf that signs up for that they must know what they're in for when they get there and they realize there's only four of their friends there and they're not a shooty unit who are going to stay out of harm's way. These guys are going to run in there, try and hit things with their axes, and probably die. We've got Gilfoss in the chat. Hello there. From California, apparently. And... Am I going to pronounce this correctly? Are we looking at a Andr... Andrej? Andre? You'll have to let me know. Anyway, we have got a live chat down there brewing. It is a packed house in here. There are people who aren't commenting along. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe and all that good stuff, by the way. We have got 10 Thunderers in this list. And they do have the Champion, or the Veteran, as he's known in this unit. And they all have handguns. And I don't think there is a musician or anything in this unit. Nope. And then we have the Rangers. So... For the first two games, I had them divided into two units, one of 15, one of 12. The unit of 12 with great weapons and shields, so those were the Bugman's Rangers, and I would be planning to use them in more of a combat potential role, so maybe set up closer to the enemy. And the ones with just plain crossbows are just your basic Rangers, no great weapons, no shields. So that was the initial two units that then turned out to be illegal. So for the next, for day two, they got merged into one big unit, and to make the points uh, still fit in, I had to remove everybody's shields and give everyone a great weapon. And then the points just about matched up to where it was supposed to be. Because if I'd given them all the equipment, because they all have to be equipped the same way, so if I'd kept them equipped with great weapons and shields, the list would have then been too expensive, and if I'd dropped them all, it would have been way under. So. We'll see if any of my day one opponents suffer the wrath of having two ranger units to deal with illegally. And we've got two units of five iron drakes, each one with just a troll hammer torpedo. So ignore the banner. The musician there is just representing the champion with a troll hammer torpedo in the unit. Because that is the way to run them, it seems. Minimum unit size, the torpedo, like a mini cannon, use that for killing the big stuff. And then the two organ guns. You can't take runes, but the engineer will be able to help them by re-rolling one artillery dice per turn, as long as they're within his command aura, which of course they will be, because he's going to be guarding them. And if, for some miracle, I don't want to re-roll one of the artillery dice, then he can also use his ability to make a unit re-roll ones to hit as well. And the gyrocopter. I think that's the last unit. Yeah, not mentioned that one yet. So the old gyro, and I've given it the clatter guns so that it can march and still shoot. Probably not going to hit much, but it gives it extra mobility uh, because you're not having to worry about just moving a smaller distance and then shooting. So you can move a huge distance across the battlefield and then unload your shots. So we've got some close-ups of my army here. This is when it was laid out on day two, which is why all the rangers are bunched together in one unit. And Goblin Green bases, bringing them back from the 90s. And I've actually got a base right here on my painting desk for the anvil to go on as well. A nice round base that's just slightly bigger than the anvil itself, so that you can get a bit of grass on it. And my War Machine crew bases have arrived as well, which are 3 by ones so they won't have to go on this awkward square size with a, a blank space there. 
and hand painted freehand BSB there. And if anyone who knows their dwarf runes can tell me what that says in the chat, then bonus points for you. Okay, into game one. And what do I think I'm going to struggle against at this event? Well, let's just go back and look at my whole army first then. So, I think issues are going to come along with multiple large flying things. So I only have one real combat unit here. Uh, one of the ranger units is kind of combat themed, and then later on when they turn into a massive block with great weapons, of course, they're much better in combat. But really, starting off with just this as a fighting unit, the hammer is everything else is geared towards shooting. So anything that can get into my lines and start fighting my shooting units is obviously bad. So other than that, what could be an issue? Uh, lots of speed, obviously, would be more frightening than things that are very slowly walking towards me shooting. Also, maybe enemies that have scout or uh, ambush abilities, perhaps, that could ambush behind my war machines would be quite terrifying. So we'll see if I come up against any of that. Game one, and I'm pulling up the list for my game one opponent now. This is the Warriors of Chaos, and they are represented by some very interesting alternative Chaos Dwarf models that are large, so they do look like Chaos Warriors, and there's a classic Marauder Giant in there as well. So, let's see. Gilthos says, my unit of five gyrocopters with clatter guns has been amazing, especially using fire and flee, understand, and with stand and shoot. Yes, that does sound good actually. With the clatter guns, I think the fact that it's a D6 shot, so if you only have one of them, a lot of the time you're just going to have one shot. So a unit of five, I can see how that would be much more menacing. And stand and shoot from those guys while they're fleeing would be quite scary as well. But only one gyrocopter, so I'm waiting until they're re-released and then I'll get some more. I don't know whether they'll maybe bring back the even more ancient gyrocopter on made to order, because I want one of those as well. But I'm happy to settle for some of the modern ones to slot in alongside my somewhat classic metal one. This isn't the OG original gyrocopter. This is like the second or third iteration of a gyrocopter. This was the 90s, this one. And then they put it in fine cast later, but I don't have that one. This one's metal, and it's not, somehow not fallen apart yet. So back to the Warriors of Chaos list. Now, let's have a look at them a bit closer so I can show you the units. Now, obviously, there is a giant. So that is a Chaos Giant, which is 230 points. And that has regeneration and heavy armor. 6 plus regeneration. So that's pretty good. Then the unit to its left is 20 Chaos Warriors, and they have additional hand weapons, heavy armor, shields, mark of zinch, standard bearer, and musician. So additional hand weapons says to me that their armor isn't going to be quite as good as if they had shields, so extra tasty shooting target. Yummy yummy. And in their unit they have a sorcerer as well, an exalted sorcerer, I think with light armor, level two wizard on foot. And I think that's the only wizard in the list. So level four wizards can potentially be an issue for my dwarf list. Because if they stay outside of dispel range and if they have ri uh, sufficient range on their dangerous spells to cast them towards my army, I can't do anything about them because obviously the anvil can't move. And even if level four wizards do come into range, on average, if they're casting, for example, a Vortex that doesn't specifically target one of my units, so it wouldn't worry about my, my magic resistance, then on average, I wouldn't successfully stop those spells. I can still try, and I've added in the extra Dispel runes onto the Anvil to give me a bit more of a chance. So a level 2, I'm not too worried about that, and especially the fact that it's in a combat block means that it's going to be coming towards me and probably into Dispel range as well, which is nice. Uh, the Exalted Sorcerer, does he have anything else? He's got a Spell Familiar. The Ruby Ring of Ruin, which is an extra Fireball, which we're seeing a lot of at the moment. Then over here we have, obviously one thing I'm terrified of seeing, a 594 point Chaos Lord on a Chaos Dragon. With Bedazzling Helm, Crown of Everlasting Conquest, Mark of Nurgle. So this thing is going to be tough to kill, is my thoughts. And it's a very cool model, especially like the rider on this one, actually. 
Then we have some cavalry. So there are two cavalry units in this list. This is five Chaos Chosen Knights, which is 311 points. You expect them to be good. They've got lances, shields, Mark of Nurgle, Banner of the Gods, which I think is the one that gives you extra combat resolution. Is that right? Could be wrong. That could be a different one. And then there are six skirmishing Marauder Horsemen. And they have javelins and light armor. So skirmish is obviously a bit more difficult to shoot, but they don't really have any armor, so that makes up for it. So, not a lot of units is what I'm thinking when I look at this, and I'm going to be able to kind of funnel them into the center, hopefully. So I've put my fighty ranger unit. For anyone who's just joined, by the way, I'm aware that my list is illegal, because you're not supposed to have two units of rangers in your core. So after it was pointed out to me that the list is actually illegal, in the later games I then mashed them together into one unit. So I've got my rangers with great weapons and shields out on this flank to deal with the marauder horsemen. Got my gyrocopter over there as well to do a bit of a flanking manoeuvre. I've got my two iron drake units in front of the hammerers who have gone very wide. So, the thinking here is that the iron drakes would like to be charged because they've got really good stand and shoot. And I think I've actually got one unit like a millimetre behind the other one. So that they can't be charged at the same time. I would like it to be just into one of them. So the other one doesn't get killed without getting to stand and shoot. And the hammer is behind so that when the time comes for the hammerers to fight, crunch, in they go. And I've given my hammerers, if I didn't mention it actually, I've given the hammerers drill so that they can redress their ranks before uh, making a move including a charge and I also gave them the master rune of hesitation on their banner which means that anyone who charges them can't use lances or extra attacks that they get on the charge or anything like that which makes them pretty cool got mad flail in the chat Ilfos says large aerocopter units are another amazing thing to hunt wizards that are hiding in the back out of range of the anvil yes that's a good idea in the middle you can see the anvil staring down the enemy and my organ guns who are in the woods. So the terrain maps at the Old World square-based TSN events, you get three of these cards and you roll off and the loser removes one of the cards. So that terrain layout is not being used and then the winner picks one of the remaining two. So there's only one that has the hills centrally and in the deployment zone. So that's probably not going to get used with a dwarf gun line involved because if the opponent is taking away the first card, they're obviously going to remove that one. And if they win the roll and I leave that one in the remaining two, they're obviously going to take that one out. So I do pick one where there are hills in the deployment zone, but not in the middle, which would be my ideal situation, obviously. And you can see that my thunderers are on the hill and I've put my other rangers the ones with just crossbows, just staring down, because the enemy have to walk through here, really. Unless they want to stay back and just get organ gunned, and that's probably not going to work well for them, because they don't really have any shooting. So, there are the Thunderers. And with my Vanguard move, the Gyrocopter moves up behind the Rangers as well. And obviously it will have to move to here if it wants to shoot past them, because it's not a large target. The Giant and the Chaos Lord on the Dragon are large targets. Yes, the Rangers Conga line. I've put them in Skirmish Formation. Now, Skirmish Formation is fine for movement, but what I discover in a later game is that if you put them in... Uh, not the... in the Open Order Formation, then you don't get the benefits of being a skirmisher, but you can stay in a long line, and if you get charged, then you all get to attack still, because you do have a fighting rank. So in later games, I do try it out, but initially I've just got them as skirmishers. And I go first. So the first thing that happens is the anvil doesn't enchant any of my troops. By the way, if anyone's played Dragon Age Origins and you're doing an enchantment spell, then you have to say, Enchantment! like the classic enchanting character from Dragon Age Origins. I'm trying to get that to catch on in the community. I don't know if it's going to take. It might. And then if you succeed, you can then pronounce it more excitedly, like enchantment. If nobody gets that reference, then it's just being wasted here. But hopefully someone does. 
So it fails with his enchantment spell. And I do whittle away at the enemy with some shooting. So some of these Chaos Warriors are going to start dying as a result of my organ guns, for instance. And my rangers. I don't want to move them because they're ponderous. So they'd be minus two to hit if they move. So just the ones that can actually see them past this big block of terrain. Yeah, rangers are a very good option in the dwarf list. And the Marauder Horsemen take a bit of a battering from these rangers with their crossbows as well. So four of them dead instantly. And, or no, two of them. Because, yeah, that's where the unit is deployed, I think. So two of them have been killed. And, yeah, there's two there. And then four Chaos Warriors have been killed. That's the dead pile in the corner there. I've also sent my Slayer out into the middle. Because he's not going to really block line of sight from the Thunderers. Because they're on a hill. And the organ gun, he's only a tiny little guy, so it can still see decently past him for now. And there we go, the shot of the day, that is. The Dragon Slayer staring down the Marauder Giant. That's what we want to see in the Old World, isn't it? This is exactly the view we want to see in the Old World. I think everyone can get behind that. So, on to the Chaos Warrior's turn. Yes, John. Toned buttocks indeed. So the giant heads out there, and he doesn't go towards the dragon slayer, weirdly enough. It's almost like he knows that the slayer is designed to hurt monsters, and is just avoiding it. So probably a wise move. Chaos Warriors moving up. The problem is, the issue the Chaos Warriors are having here, is that if they march, then the wizard can't do any of his spells. If they don't march, then they're very slowly walking towards a gun line. So having only one combat unit that needs to get across the table and having a wizard in there maybe is something to change in future games. Which I think is something my opponent did say he was going to modify going forwards. So these cards behind them here, I believe these are the when the Chaos Gods cast their eye upon their champion and bestow them with some kind of blessing each turn. So it looks like plus one strength has been given to this one. And what's this? A Dead Slayer? That's because the wizard, instead of marching, just decides to kill him with a fireball. So the Slayer is immediately dead. Doesn't even get to fight any of the monsters. But at least his body is right there in front of the enemy. So they are going to have to walk across him. And one of them may well stub their toe. So that's a good use of a Slayer, I would say. You can see that the Knights are ignoring my flank with the Rangers and the Gyrocopter, and they're heading towards the meat of the matter in the centre. Turn two for me, so what am I going to do here? Well, the Giant is quite close, and he's also blocking some of my lines of sight to the Chaos Lord on Dragon. So I'm going to try to blast the Giant to death with the Thunderers and the Organ Guns, maybe the Anvil. And then I've also got this unit of Chosen Knights to shoot at here with the Iron Drakes. But maybe the Iron Drakes will go for the Giant, because they do multiple wounds with the Trollhammer Torpedoes. So I'll have to split my fire up a little bit, but these are the two main threats. I can't really get too much of my firepower into the Dragon right now. So let's see, the Rangers finish off the Marauder Horsemen. They're all dead, so the Rangers now stuck with not much to do. Gyrocopter heads in behind the Chosen Knights and doesn't do anything. The Iron Drakes spread out a bit, and they're going to start blasting, and the Hammerers angle themselves slightly as well. So one thing to consider with the Hammerers, if you're going to change their ranks before you go into combat, you want to make sure that you've got space either side of the unit if you want to make them wider. So for example now, I could only fit maybe one extra guy on this side, and then one extra guy on that side. So I think you have to go from the centre outwards, so you can't just pile them all on this edge. If you want to go narrower, it's not an issue, but you do want to watch out what's on your flanks if you're thinking of going wider at some point. We've got Samuel in the chat there, who is obviously appreciative of Slayer Butts, as we all are. The giant takes five wounds, so I think he's only got one left. Just all the shooting whittles him down. And look at this, the Chaos Warriors, they're not looking very scary anymore, are they? They've also been heavily whittled down by all the shooting. Yeah, there's six of them gone. And yeah, it's not looking too good for the Warriors of Chaos. They're 
surrounded and they're being blasted to smithereens. This giant, with one wound, you wouldn't fancy his chances of surviving a charge into the Iron Drakes with that stand and shoot. The dragon has a much better chance. The chosen knights don't take any casualties. Uh, so they've got away with one there. Uh, John says, more whittling than a scout camp. Yes. There is a lot of whittling that goes on at those, I'm led to believe. So this amount of whittling is definitely comparable, I would say. Turn two for the Chaos Warriors. And plus one attacks goes to the uh, a blessing that's bestowed upon the Chaos Lord on the dragon. And it's very handy that I've taken these pictures upside down, isn't it? But it looks like plus one strength and plus one attack has gone to the sorcerer, which aren't things that are going to benefit him greatly. Then, stand and shoot. This is what dwarves are really good at. Stand and shoot kills two of the, of the chosen knights. And it also kills the giant, by the way. But the dragon still gets in there, untouched, because the stand and shoot was targeted into the giant. So that is a significant amount of points that that stand and shoot just killed. I may well lose these guys, but I've got the hammerers behind as backup. So we'll see what happens there. The Chaos Warriors just move forward. They may actually march this time. I don't know if he wanted to do any spells because they just want to close the distance to the enemy. We've got some Iron Drakes down, unfortunately, and the dragon overruns into the hammerers, which is fine by me. You count as charging. You're not getting any charge bonuses because of my master rune of hesitation on the banner. And so here's a really interesting thing that I haven't really had in my mind at this point in the tournament, but I definitely start doing it a lot more later. With the Hammerers, if you've got a Thane or a King in the unit, you can issue a challenge or receive a challenge with any Hammerer. And that means if you're fighting just a giant hero monster like this, if you issue a challenge with the one Hammerer at the back, that means that he's obviously going to get killed. But the overkill may not be sufficient to actually cause you to fail a leadership test, depending on how many ranks you've got and whether you've got a BSB in there and other bonuses. So that means you'll only lose one guy per turn. So as long as you're not losing by so much as to break you and cause you to flee, then that's a pretty nifty strategy. It would work better if you have more ranks because then you have higher static combat resolution. So you could actually end up winning a combat by doing that, even if you just sacrifice one guy each turn. So that's an interesting thing to think about. But when you're this wide, what you're thinking is, actually, he may only kill like three or four of them, and then we're going to be able to womp him in the face and do some wounds back with our massive hammers. So that part of you may well win out in the end. More Iron Drakes killed, and the final one flees and the Chosen are also overrun into the Hammerers. So we're going to have lots of stuff to womp in the next turn. And on to turn three for the Dwarves. So what am I going to do here? Well, the only thing left to shoot with the Chaos Warriors, so they are not going to have a good time, because we've got two organ Guns, Thunderers, Crossbows, and the Gyro, who can all go after them. These Rangers kind of stuck out the game, but they're not going to die, so they're preserving their points, and they can start heading back this way. And then the Hammerers are going to just try and kill who they can. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the old hammer trick to get one of these mega heroes tied up in combat wouldn't necessarily work here because there's also an enemy champion in the combat as well who could accept on the monster's behalf. So that's a good tip. If you're going into one of the units where their regular troops can accept or issue challenges, then if you send two units in, one of whom has a champion, then they can accept the challenge on your monster's behalf. So you don't have to get tied up. There's all kinds of other ways of tying up enemies based on challenges, which will come up in later games as well. So, blasting. All the Chaos Warriors are dead, except for the Champion and the Sorcerer. So that's cool. And my Iron Drake is fleeing. Because it's down to the last model, it may well flee off the table now, unfortunately. And we're going to get to combat. So there is a challenge from one of my hammerers, which the chosen champion accepts. And three hammerers go down. And I do some wounds back. So we look at the combat resolution and it's actually a draw. Look at this classic 8th edition combat resolution counter. So let's see. So I've got a close order unit. At least one of these two units is close order, maybe both. I've got a BSB. 
I've got a rank. And yeah, so we end up at a draw. Which is cool, because I've got the supremacy elsewhere on the battlefield. So if this isn't going horribly against me, that's very beneficial. Now, gold-plated, you say. I'm not quite sure they're gold-plated. Gold-painted, perhaps, but I'm not sure about plated. On to turn three for the vile forces of chaos, and the sorcerer and the champion from the Chaos Warriors unit declare charges into the gyrocopter, and I think I just fire and flee, but don't do anything with the shots, but clearly get away. They redirect their charges, though, towards the dwarf warriors, but I don't think they actually make it, because it's too far. More hammerers getting killed, but more Chaos Chosen Knights getting killed as well, because these hammers just do some serious whomping. And I do lose the combat this time. And they d the hammerers do fall back in good order, and they're then pursued down by the two remaining. So I'm hopeful that the hammerers can survive the game, because there's so many of them. And then I can slaughter this final Chosen Knight. If I was this final chosen, would I stay in combat? Because I suppose if it was my turn next, which it is, you don't want to be standing here because the organ guns are just going to blast you to death. So maybe going into combat is a wise move. If it was the chaos turn next, you would probably want to stay out in the open because then you could maybe charge one of the organ guns. So it's important when you're deciding whether to follow up the enemy in combat and remain in contact with them, figuring out whose turn is it next and do you want to be standing out in the open or not. So on my turn, the gyrocopter makes that long charge there and rear charges the chosen, which is going to get me extra combat resolution and manage to kill it. So not a lot going on now. The hammerers aren't falling at a dramatic rate. And the Chaos Champion and the Sorcerer have been killed as well with all my shooting, so that's nice. By the way, I'm using this as the Anvil's enchantment of giving one of my units uh, either re-roll to their saves or re-roll and plus one armour. If I use the swirly side of it, it means it's got the extra powerful buff with plus one armour and re-rolls, and if I use the skull on the other side, it means it's just the re-rolls. So there's really just this big flyer left. And, by the way, my Iron Drake has fled off the table by now, if you hadn't noticed. So a bit more combat done, and this is where I can keep challenging this guy now. And I'm losing three on the overkill each time, but because he has to accept, he's kind of stuck killing one hammerer per turn. And it's not going to end well. Even if I lose combat, I'm very unlikely to run away with my BSB in there as well. Onto my five and the gyrocopter gets back into the action, charging in, which means that I get flank charge to increase my combat res and I've got two units in combat. But I do decide actually I'm going to just not challenge this time and try and kill this guy because I want to get even more points to get a higher a point differential. Got plenty of viewers in there. Only five likes though, which is quite disgraceful. Ice Wolf says gold plastic. Yes, it is very much gold plastic, as is this. All the little fancy tokens from 8th edition from that very limited, very exclusive golden set are all plastic that happens to be gold coloured. So my hammerers do lose quite a lot and fall back in good order again, but because the gyrocopter did not fall back, then this guy is stuck fighting the gyrocopter and can't pursue them, so that's nice. So the gyrocopter may well die. You can see my rangers doing a very slow plodding march into the centre of the table to actually contribute to the game. All my shooting has nothing to target at the moment, because the gyrocopter was still in there in the fight, and at this point, the gyrocopter obviously gets killed in the next turn by the Chaos Lord. Uh, but that means the Chaos Lord is stuck out in the open and I'm going to maybe get a turn of shooting him. So with my turn 6, the Hammerers just move out of the charge arc of the Chaos Sorcerer. Now they can't go very far, so the Anvil has to help them with a Conveyance spell. Let's see, I have the same set. It was, was it not from a supplement magic focused... It was from, it was a, the one I got, it wasn't part of a mega supplement, it was kind of a separate, it was in a, like a, sh a plastic container that was kind of like shrink wrapped, or shrink plastic, what do you call it? 
vacuum plastic in there. I'm sure that's a very... not the best way of putting it, but like a blister pack. And you had the combat resolution counter, you've got the charge markers, you've got like swirling magic tokens, you've got all the little pins, and you've got the front arc measuring device. All that came in there. So I think it was sold separately, but it may well have been part of a supplement as well. I think I got mine on eBay after it went off sale. So got the hammerers out of the charge arc. This her photo was taken after it turned round to look at them so it could try and blast them. But I also had one turn to shoot it with all my weapons and didn't manage to kill it because it's got all kinds of like ward saves on it. So I'm not going to kill it, but I've killed everything else. So that's good. And you can see that the Chaos Lord did turn around and try and flame my unit, but unsuccessfully only killed one. Let's see. It's crazy how inaccurate the measuring tool was in that gold set. I think at 10 inch range it was more than an inch off. Yes, actually, the gold... They did do like a golden tape measure, didn't they? So I didn't get that. My set did not have the golden tape measure in it. Mine was more just the tokens rather than the measuring implements. So I'm sure anything that Citadel or GW have put out over the years using it as a true measuring device has always been a little bit risky. If you look at, I've actually got a video on the red whippy sticks coming back and their range has never been reliable. So the hammers are down to one model so my opponent will score some points for getting them to below 25% strength and there are some dead iron drakes as well. Not a lot else. I've got a lot of points for killing things but this guy is very expensive. That sorcerer uh, not Sorcerer, the Chaos Lord, is 594 points and he's not dead. So that results in a 15-5 win for me. And just a win in general, which is very nice. Because that's what you want. Wins. That's what we live for, isn't it? So, going back... I'm on the BCP app here, which is where we input our scores for these tournaments. So, going on to the next game. Oh, in fact, any final thoughts on that game? I think it was very difficult for my opponent, really. It was a very slow, plodding, powerful unit with a sorcerer in it. Not not enough spell casting, really. You've got to have spell supremacy against the dwarves. If you can put down vortexes to block my shooting lines of sight, you can actually move. And they just didn't seem to have the tools to be able to do that. The one thing that I did worry about was the flyer, and that's what caused me the most problems, obviously. On to the next round, and this is Mountain Pass, which means that you have this weird setup area. So you're still only 24 inches apart, but you can set up way further back if you want. I'm not going to set up particularly far back because I don't want my units to accidentally flee off the table because of one bad roll. What am I against this time? Well, you may notice that I'm up against the Warriors of Chaos for two games in a row. So I'll crack open that list right now. Opening up on the app here. So, interestingly, this list is 1999 points, not quite 2000. So, we have a Chaos Lord, not on a dragon this time with a bedazzling helm and all that cool stuff, so it's ward saves and regeneration and things piled up on him, but he's on a manticore up on that hill, so not a dragon. And going into this game, my opponent was not feeling very confident, I definitely got that impression, because this gun line is a serious threat to these small units that are actually going to get to me, and then this unit of Warriors of Chaos, they're set up in marching column, because obviously they want to get to me faster. But my opponent did not look confident seeing all these guns out on the table. So what else is in there? There is a Sorcerer Lord who is hanging out at the back outside of the Anvil's Dispel range. Probably a good idea. And what does that one have? It's a level 4, a Law Familiar, Spell Familiar, Demonology spells. There is an Aspiring Champion who is the BSB on foot, who I'm guessing is in this unit here. Can't really see from this angle. There are two units of five Chaos Knights with lances. A Mark of Chaos Undivided, Mark of Corn, and Full Command. One is there and one is up at the top there. And then two 
units of five Chaos Warhounds, which are very cheap, 35 points, but as soon as they start taking casualties, they're quite likely to just run away. Chaos is always popular, and it was my first fully painted Warhammer Fantasy Army, Chaos Warriors. So back in the day, it was when they did the first multi-part plastic kits, and Chaos Warriors, correct me if I'm wrong, were the first one where they started doing one for each army, or more than one in some cases, and giving you a movement trait in the box with them. So I had one unit of <clears throat> one unit of 12 Chaos Warriors, which was the standard size at the time, 4x3, one unit of Chaos Warriors with halberds, which they did with the metal upgrades for the arms, and I had the chariots back then, which was really cool, and I had some Chaos Marauders, I had pretty much all the special characters. I had the 90s Archaean, who was a little bit smaller than the later one, but he's maybe one of my favourite models. I had, uh, what's his name? Arbel the Undefeated, the Corn Champion, mounted. There was Acold Hellbrass, the Zinch Champion that could never die, so whenever you kill him, he would just appear somewhere else on the battlefield. I had a really cool Chaos Warrior army, and I wish I still had that, actually. I'm hoping they bring back some of the cooler stuff when they get round to doing this army in the old world, and probably on a made-to-order basis, I would definitely get some of those characters again. I don't think they'll go back to the plastic warriors that I grew up on, but I could probably make do with the later ones. But Chaos Warriors are definitely on my list as an army to do, after Dwarves and Bretonians. They're on my list, so consider yourself warned, community. So... The 23 Chosen Chaos Warriors, which is a 585 point unit by the way, so very expensive. They're drilled like the hammers, so they can change their formation. They have the Banner of Rage, and it doesn't tell me on here exactly what that does, but I'm sure someone will know. They have full plate armor and shield, so they have good saves, and that is mildly concerning, but not especially, because I do have quite good AP and armor bane across my army. Now, crossbows... Well, actually, here's a side point. The Dwarf units, they have a crazy variety of AP and Armor Bane combinations, so it's quite difficult when you're starting to remember which one has which. So the Crossbows don't have any AP as standard, but Armor Bane too. So thematically, I suppose that makes sense, because a Crossbow hitting the armor isn't going to be as good as, let's say, a bullet. But if you get to get it into an eye slot, then obviously that is quite good, because it's a very tiny little point it's going through. So, uh, that makes sense. The Thunderers are AP 1, Armor Bane 1, so they have a little bit more AP as standard, but when you roll a 6, they're the same as the Crossbows. The Iron Drakes are AP 1, Armor Bane 2, and so are the Organ Guns. So, a good AP to start with, and really good AP if you roll that 6. The Trollhammer Torpedo is just a straight minus 3 AP. Uh, the... Anvil's Striking the Rune Magic Missile is AP2. And in combat, there's quite a difference as well. So Gromril Hand Weapons, which all the heroes will generally have, are AP1. The Hammers are AP2, Armor Bane 2. I think Iron Breakers with their Gromril Weapons are AP1 in combat. And then you can get Armor Bane from putting a Rune Smith or a Rune Lord in with them as well. So you can have a wide variety of AP and armor bane across the dwarf list. So a lot of that's going to be wasted if you're facing just like puny goblins with rubbish saves. So here's my layout. I've got the thunderers on the hill. So this is the bit of the hill that's actually in my deployment zone. So this is why I've set up across this line, because I've got a hill for the thunderers to go on. And I've also got this building. And this building is shielding the flank of my war machines, because I don't want anyone to land there and have a free reign to charge across my whole line. I want them to come into the front, and that means that if they have to overrun through the war machine, they won't go into another one. So I feel that is important. I've got my anvil in the middle between the two machines with the engineer, and I've got them slightly staggered. I don't know if you can see that, but I don't have any of them perfectly aligned with each other, which means that only one of them at a time can be charged. I've put my Slayer out in front of the building, and I've put my two units of Rangers here, out in front, screening my whole army just so I can start shooting things like this Chaff and the Knights before they get in. And the Thunderers are going to start blasting as well. So, let's move on. There you can see the BSB. I think that's the BSB, actually. The one with all the snow. 
Nice Manticore model there. Turn one for the Dwarves first, the Dwarven Mountain Holds. So you can see that the Anvil has given its enchantment to my Rangers with Great Weapons, because I have a feeling they're going to be attacked in the first turn. And you can immediately see that five of the Warhounds are dead and two of this unit are dead, but they've not run away. And I've also put quite a lot of resources into shooting the Manticore, including the Gyrocopter, who can see it because it's a large target and it's on a hill. So loads of dead dogs and three wounds remaining, I think that is, on the Manticore. So I've done a few wounds there, which is good. A good start on the Manticore. And my opponent, definitely, I could tell, was not feeling confident at this stage. One of the organ guns does misfire, though, which is comical because the engineer is right there. So I rolled two misfires on the artillery dice, re-rolled one of them and got the misfire again. But as a result of that, it's not going to be able to fire in the next turn, which is a little bit disappointing. And let's see what Chaos do to retaliate against that opening salvo. So the Manticore makes it into my Rangers. These ones only have crossbows. And I've got them in skirmish formation, by the way. Which, again, I hadn't really considered at this point in the tournament. The idea of putting them into open order instead of skirmishing. The Warhounds and the Chaos Knights also make charges. So all these charges were very long, by the way. These were supremely long charges that my opponent made into all my Rangers. And the stand and shoe obviously hasn't done much. So we're into combat now. And because I've got them in skirmish formation, the ones that are in base contact form a line and then you rank up behind those guys. So these guys appear in this little block now, but they don't get any kinds of rank bonus or anything like that. But skirmish formation, I'm learning when you get charged, it's not as good. So if you're in uh, open order and you form a line and you get charged, everyone would then be able to fight. So that's something I do pick up later in the tournament. Okay, so... I think this dice is representing the bonus that's been bestowed upon to this particular Chaos Lord. Now, what is happening here? My Rangers fall back, and they fall back beyond the Dragon Slayer. So the Manticore overruns into the Dragon Slayer. Which gives me a very interesting opportunity which we'll come to in a moment, but it is it is definitely very interesting. I promise you that. And you can see all these ranger casualties there that haven't been moved over to the corpse pile yet. On this side, I lose quite a few rangers as well for, from the Chaos Knights. The one lying down is just because he wouldn't fit on the hill. I think he just fell over. Now, the mountain pass is quite interesting, actually, because you've got much more of a narrow space to fight in than normal. And should you choose, obviously, you can deploy really far back. If you've brought, like, really long-range cannons, then you could do that. But I didn't feel like my gun line is particularly long-range. The furthest range I've got on any of my guns is 30. So, the rangers are gone. So, slaughtered. So, Bugman, not doing very well so far. And, okay, so this is quite funny now. This is the opportunity I was talking about. This manticore is in combat with a Slayer, but because the Rangers are in skirmish formation, the, the Slayer isn't blocking them at all, so they can still charge back in. So the Rangers do charge in, and I'm thinking, you know what, this Slayer is unbreakable. So if I challenge with the Ranger Champion, that buys me a whole turn, because even if I lose the combat by maximum of the overkill, the Slayer is just unbreakable anyway. So this guy's going to be tied up in combat, unable to punch the Slayer, which is cool. There we go. So obviously he gets eaten, but the Slayer is standing there in combat. Even though these guys, I think they just give ground a little bit. So there is a benefit there to having an unbreakable character alongside another unit that has someone that can issue a challenge. Because even if you lose the combat by 10 billion then the unbreakable unit is going to stay there. So I think that's a cool combo. Now, if I was writing the rules for Slayers, I would probably put something in there that says that they have to be the one that issues a challenge to a monster rather than the champion of another unit. Because it's not particularly thematic for the ranger champion to step up and say, Manticore, I challenge you. And the Slayer's like, yep, that's fine by me. I'll just sit back here and watch you get eaten, rather than seeking my glorious death. So I would have put that in there. But as it stands, I don't believe there is anything like that in there. 
Now, you can't have the Slayers join units, but you can get them in multi-combats like this. And you see here that the Chaos Knights have made it into the Thunderers with the Overrun, which is bad news for them. We're going to be going into... Oh, you can see here that these Knights are in position to threaten me, and they've also stayed out of line of sight of at least one organ gun. Turn two for Chaos now, because I'd have my Gyrocopter just out of harm's way on the hill, just doing a bit of blasting. And the Chaos forces do charge in to the remaining Rangers with the Chaos Knights, meaning that the Manticore can focus his efforts on murdering the Dragon Slayer. But because they are both in combat there, they can't overrun into my war machines because they're both facing this building. And the Chaos Warriors continue marching up, I think, because they just want to get as close as possible. And if you charge from an unrealistic distance, all you're doing is eating stand and shoot and then probably failing the charge. This Sorcerer, who these dice are representing the bonuses, so I think one is actually stupidity, so I think the Sorcerer has become stupid and is doing wounds with, a, I think, a fireball or something to my gyrocopter there, which is obviously very unkind indeed. And let's see the results of these combats. Malign Musings. Dan here, excellent timing. Ah, yes, so that'll be your list then here that I've got up on my screen and our game in progress then, I presume. So, hello. You've missed all the bits at the start where I was talking about how you didn't seem very confident when you saw all my guns. So, the Slayer has been murdered. The Rangers have been murdered, but because of the positioning here, no overrunning into my stuff is allowed. The Manticore decides the best bet is to overrun and just end up over the top of the building, bounce to the other side, because then at least this organ gun is going to have a hard time shooting it. Because obviously that is a worry, because it's taken a load of wounds already. These knights, though, are kind of stuck. They're going to have to spend at least a turn kind of reorienting themselves somehow before they can get involved in the game again, because this terrain is really playing havoc with their manoeuvrability. And from this angle, you can see that we really have to start dealing with this unit now as well. Or do we? That's the question. Do I just start blasting this unit of knights, or do I try and whittle here instead? You can see that this organ gun at least has its line of sight obscured. So, on to the next turn. And, well actually it's one more combat. So the Thunderers get killed, run down. The knights go towards the difficult terrain. Actually, it's dangerous terrain. So all the forests are dangerous terrain at this event, which is going to make it an interesting choice for them whether they wheel and put themselves in harm's way of dying on the roll of a one, or do they like back up for a turn and waste a bit of time, or do they realign themselves in some weird way? The sorcerer gets charged by my gyrocopter, so they're going to have a, a fun little fight to the death. The sorcerer did put a vortex down in front of it as well, I think which subsequently moved. So let's start blasting at full power. The organ gun is no longer worried about misfiring, so let's see what we can do. Well, more wounds to this guy, and I think the manticore is actually down to its final wound. So it's very risky if he wants to get back involved in the game now. Over here, I just spend a turn buffing up with the anvil this unit of Iron Drakes with enchantment and waiting for these Chaos Warriors to charge into something. And I've made sure the hammers are extra wide so that when we do get into combat, we're going to get a billion attacks. And my. These guys were supposed to be a screen, but they've not done a very good job. The enemy just totally ignored them. So they're going to start coming back in and maybe look for some action over here. Okay, so onto the Chaos turn and obviously the charge into the Iron Drakes. Did any of them get killed by that? Possibly from the stand and shoot. And we'll see if they can murder an overrun. Now there's a really interesting situation that comes up in a minute as well. So the Chaos Warriors change their width. They don't go as wide as they possibly could. Because what they want to do, I believe the intent, is that after combat they overrun into the Iron Drakes. And then because of the width of the unit, they would then not sufficiently have enough to also contact the Hammerers, I think. And the Hammerers 
Because they because this unit of Chaos Warriors wouldn't stick out very far, the Hammerers would then have to make a disordered charge into them, so then I wouldn't get initiative bonus. And I wouldn't be able to make contact with many models. So it would be a weird, bizarre situation if you look at this unit of Iron Drake kind of blocking the way. So yes, we'll see what happens. Yes, that is the thought process behind it, as confirmed in the chat there. So the Chaos Warriors would count as charging for overrunning, but the Hammerers, if they then made a disordered charge, would then not get any bonuses. And the Chaos Knights in the woods do decide, you know what, we're not scared of a bit of a, tr a, bit of branch or a bit of tree root tripping our horse. We're going to turn around and take our chances and they are rewarded for that by not dying. The other knights just back up a bit because they were stuck. And the Manticore flies off to hide as well. It's down to its last wound, so that is a good choice. The organ guns can now no longer see it because we were treating this as a big just blocking piece of terrain. For simplicity's sake. The Gyrocopter and the Wizard have a bit of a duel, and they've both taken wounds at this stage. And let's see what happens to these Iron Drakes. Well, they get killed. And there's the overrun into the next unit of Iron Drakes. There's the combat resolution. You can see, uh, well, they kind of get killed. They lose three, and then they flee through the Hammerers. So there's still two left, which is pretty cool. So they can actually contribute to the game a bit. And now when I make my charge, it's going to be horribly disordered. But you will see why my opponent regretted that in a minute as well. So the Knights are closing in with a pincer movement. So even though I've done some really good shooting damage, I've also now been surrounded and I've lost quite a lot of units as well. Some of them expensive units. So it's very close on the scores right now. So I need to finish off some units. So what am I going to do this turn? The organ guns are going to blast away at this unit of knights, try and kill them in one go. Hopefully the anvil helps out as well. The Iron Drake's going to start blasting over here. And this fight's still going to go on. This fight's going to go on. So the hammerers, I go super wide before I charge, as wide as I can go. And then I make a disordered charge. And we believe this is the correct way to do it. So they would wheel into combat, touch, so they've succeeded, but then they can't close the door, so it's now a disordered charge. But because I'm a million wide, I still get a billion attacks to fight them with. And the, because the Chaos Warriors are not a billion wide, only one of them is in base contact, so they don't get very many attacks at all, so they have to put them into the Iron Drakes. And they do manage to kill three and two Hammerers before I get to strike, but that's still going to be a billion Hammerers hitting them back, which end up whittling them down. And the combat result is that I think we get a draw, which is kind of acceptable for the situation. I will take that. It looks like we've actually got nine each there, with the little the little pegs and the holes there. The Sorcerer does kill the Gyrocopter, unfortunately. And there's only one Chaos Knight left after the Organ Guns and the Anvil start blasting. The Engineer decides that what his mission is, he's going to spend the rest of the game moving around here and trying to take one final shot to do one final wound onto the Manticore. I think the anvil failed to gift him with additional movement, unfortunately. Or maybe I didn't use it. Actually, no, I I, I think I did, but I failed. It's, I think you need 10 to get that one, so that one's slightly less likely than some of the other runes. But you can see, because the hammerers weren't brought into combat already, and I was able to go extra wide and charge, that meant at the start of the turn I was able to use enchantment on them and give them plus one to their armor and re-rolling armor saves. And they've also got the ward from the BSB in there as well. And you can see that the Iron Drakes did some good wounds here also and killed at least a couple. And one of them may have died from dangerous terrain, actually. I'm not sure how many were left in there. So into the Chaos turn, and we've got a flank charge into the Hammerers as well. Uh, you will notice, actually, that my warriors on the hill are just waiting to strike, but haven't made a successful charge on anyone yet. So, flank charge coming in. Final knight into the organ gun. Which, if he can pick that up, that's 120 points. So that is not insignificant. The sorcerer are moving into range to help out as well. And it actually flies over here, or moves over here. And it's going to try and hide from some of my war machines. So the organ gun is forced to give ground. Now I believe this is being played correctly. This is how I've been doing it. That if they give ground, they can actually move back two inches. It's only when they break that they fully abandon the machine and it's destroyed. 
Even though it has a movement of zero, I believe it can still give ground as normal, or potentially fall back in good order as normal. If that's incorrect, someone let me know, because this is how I've been playing it. So over here, this mess of a combat continues with these weird angles going on. As soon as the Iron Drakes die, it can become more simple. But Hammerer is in a challenge with the Chaos Warrior Champion. And the Hammerer actually kills him, which is great. Some more kills on either side uh, are dished out. And as a result, you can see the combat. It looks like Chaos win this time as a result of the flank charge. But the Hammerers are okay. And this may be in the next turn, but look at this attack roll for the Chaos Warriors. I think it's the Chaos Warriors. Yeah, because this is when they get in like this, so they can actually all attack to their full potential now, but then they go and roll an attack roll like this. Wow, wow, wow. I think there were maybe two hits that were pulled out of the pile, but all those misses, I had to get a picture of that. So because the hammer is a high weapon skill, obviously it's more difficult to hit them, and if you have a woeful roll like this, it's a lot more easy to do that than if you were hitting a, a lesser unit on threes. So, also, I'm not 100% sure that this is correct either, but this is how we played it. So these knights were in the flank of the hammerers, but then when the hammerers fell back in good order, the overrun would then put them into the front of the unit. So I think that's correct? Or do you just continue in the facing you were in? I think it's correct, but if it's not, someone will probably give me a million comments. Is it actually a 1 in 4096 chance of failing with that many of those dice? That's impressive then. And I believe you did another quite bad roll as well, which I, I think maybe I took a bit of a picture of over there, but that one's quite bad as well. So my warriors are really hoping to join in one of these combats and turn the tide in my favour, but they're just too slow, so they keep failing their charge. And the organ gun crew are slowly getting whittled down by this remaining knight as well. So, the fact that I've got lots of enemy units that are almost dead means I'm not picking up many points at the moment, so I need to actually finish off some of these units by the end of the game, ideally. Turn 5 for Chaos, I think. And more wounds done to the organ gun crew. Oh, there's the other terrible attack roll. So look at that one as well. Horrendous. So four hammerers do get killed, the two Chaos Knights do get killed, which is great because that's got me the points for that unit, and some more Chaos Warriors, and we draw another combat. So this fight is raging on, and we're both running out of models rapidly. Look at that, seven each. So that's going to rage on. But the hammerers are feeling the benefit of having gone wide going into combat, because we're getting a larger fighting rank than the Chaos Warriors who were narrower when the combat started because you can't then reform while combat's ongoing so here's an interesting point if you win the combat on your opponent's turn and you're drilled you force them to give ground or fall back in good order rather than following up maybe the best move then is to then change your ranks around a bit to get into a more beneficial formation either more ranks for combat resolution or more frontage if you've got the space for extra models attacking. So I do kind of like this, people say line hammer, and if you're getting like an 80 wide unit of models across the whole table, I can see how that looks silly and battles shouldn't look that way, but it does add an interesting dynamic when you can go wider, and it's not a ridiculously long line. So I think it does add some, a little bit of extra spice. Onto my turn six, so what am I going to do? Uh, it's going to be really difficult for me to kill this guy, this final knight, because it requires the organ gun crewman hitting him with his barrel swabbing stick, which I don't think is particularly fatal. And I've got nothing to shoot off because everything's gone. I've already killed the wizard with shooting, I think. So, uh, yeah, it's difficult for me to get any points. My engineer is going to probably have one shot at the manticore, see if I can kill it. So... Turn 6, and I think this is actually the Chaos Warrior turn now. So I don't kill the Manticore with my one chance, because he's hiding even better now. Or he may have popped out again, so we can maybe charge the Engineer in a minute. But this 
I, this may well happen on my turn, this bit of it, actually. So I didn't kill the Manticore with my final attempt with the shot, and then the knight overran the organ gun into the engineer. The hammerers fall back in good order again, and the iron drakes who are behind them, the chaos warriors then run into them. So that's a good opportunity to finish off the iron drakes. So what I could have been doing is hiding those two so they can't lose their points. But also, I suppose they are kind of preserving the much more expensive unit in the hammerers. You can see the chaos warriors won by, looks like, two there. So onto the chaos turn, and they do sandwich the engineer and kill him because the manticore isn't worried about stand and shoot anymore because there was already a guy in combat. And the iron drakes do get killed, and that's going to be the end of the game. So we've all got, so we've got some really expensive units still alive. The anvil is very expensive. The manticore very expensive. Chaos Warrior is very expensive. Hammer is very expensive. So as a result of that, let me look at the final result on the table here. So, I think my opponent had slightly over 100 more kill points or battle points than I did, which means that it's just about a win. So it's 11-9. So looking at this table and throughout the game, the way it was going, it did feel like it was heading for a draw. And that's pretty much how it played out in the end. It was just a, a very small amount of points that went over into the, the Chaos favour, which correctly pointing out it was the organ gun and the engineer at the end and the iron drakes being finished off in the right at the end of the game there. So those three going down definitely swung it. I think it was without those three, it was probably heading into and 11-9 for the Dwarves, I think. But obviously, the Organ Gun was going to get killed eventually. And had the, that knight been killed, yes, that would have been quite a healthy chunk, a quite healthy nugget of points going to the Dwarves if he'd been shot off as well. So, very good game, very close. And what I'm learning so far, the first game wasn't the best example because I think the Chaos Warrior list, how to put it politely, I don't think it was optimal. It only had a level 2 wizard, and one big flyer, and the giant wasn't fast enough to really help out. Had it been another big flyer instead of a giant, that would have been very scary, but the very slow unit with a level 2 wizard in it was kind of not really good at any job in the first game. So if we, if we think about more optimal lists, I think this Chaos Warrior list was much better, much stronger, some fast units, some hard-hitting units, and a wizard who wasn't in a unit so that they could actually go forward and fight and do what they're good at and the wizard could stay out of dispel range and do what he's good at which is cast some spells so i think this is a much stronger representation of chaos warriors so i think when you look at it and you think that's just a pure gun line how is this game going to be fun i think gun lines have been reduced in power sufficiently especially war machines compared to the previous editions eighth edition dwarf cannons would have killed that manticore and just had it on toast in the first turn. And you'd be very lucky to get anywhere with that thing. And the knights as well would have been probably... I think the organ guns did used to be a bit stronger. So what I'm remembering of the organ guns is that one of them... Could the organ guns use the engineer's ballistic skill? Could one of them use it? That may well have been a thing. Some of the war machines definitely could. I know bolt throwers definitely could use the engineer's ballistic skill in 8th edition. I don't remember whether organ guns could, but war machines have definitely been toned down in this, edition, in this edition. Less guaranteed wounds from them. So, I would say gun lines, once you get into them, they're going to die quite fast, but obviously you want to support them with fighting units as well, like the hammerers. So pure gun line, I don't think is going to do anything in this edition. You need some fighty units in there as well. Let's see. Knights and warriors used to be a lot stronger, according to Malign Musings. Warriors are 2 plus, 6 plus plus, standard knights were 1 plus, 6 plus plus. Yes, so I remember back in the day when knights, Chaos Knights were the strongest thing in the whole game, because they were invulnerable against strength 3 attacks. So that's when I had my Chaos Knights in, would that have been like 4th edition or so? Because they had 1-up save and 1s did not auto-fail armor saves back then. So this would have been around 1998 when I had my Chaos Warrior army. Around that time. 
So back then, if you charge Chaos Knights into a, a big blob of goblins, they could just do no damage to you. And you would just kill a few of them each turn and murder them. So I assume that rule continued for a little while because that My Chaos Warrior army was late 90s, I would say. And then later on, I remember Chaos Knights, suddenly it was like a big scandal that they could be hurt by strength three attacks now in one of the follow-up editions. So suddenly the Chaos players were outraged that they had to actually worry about goblin bows suddenly, which was kind of funny. But I'd moved on to dwarves by then. By about the year 2000, I think, I moved on to dwarves, which is when they did the multi-part dwarf box. Into the next round. And we have another open battle, and I'm just going to pause to take a small drink. So, oh, it may have been 5th edition. Was 5th edition the one with the Bretonians and Lizardmen? In the starter box, because that's when my Chaos Warriors got most of their play, so it could have been 5th. And then sixth would have been Empire and Orcs in the starter box, which is when I started playing my Dwarves. So yeah, so it was fifth edition when the Chaos Knights were immune to strength three damage. Which was fun for me, not so much fun for the strength three units that were facing me. I used to like putting Archaean in the unit of Chaos Knights as well. That was a fun time. So you've just got six models running around that just can't be harmed by a lot of stuff that was coming at you. It's kind of the way ethereal units have been at various points in the game, in the game's history. And we've got another open battle coming up. So the scenarios in the old world don't really make a lot of difference, except for the last one, except for the mountain pass, which gives you a vastly different deployment setup. A lot of them are just slightly different flavors of the same thing. It's mostly just about killing. And that's kind of what the game is, it's what it's always been, but that's not how modern games are doing it. So it'll be interesting to see if after a while they release, when they update the old world, which I'm assuming they're not just going to sit on it and abandon it and, ne and never give it any support going forward. So they'll probably, maybe not as frequently as they do with like the Age of Sigmar General's handbook, but if they do like a competitive update book every now and then, whether they would add more in-depth scenarios in it. I'm thinking the kind of scenarios you get in Kings of War, which is obviously laid out on the table, looks like a very similar game with big square blocks of troops and working out your facings and all that stuff. But in Kings of War, gun lines are way less effective because you have to actually advance up the table to score points at the end of the game. You have to control certain areas or you have to pick up tokens and carry them away and... If you can just pick up tokens and walk backwards and the enemy has a gun line, then you're not going to chase them and pick them up. So I'd be interested to see whether the old world goes that route and starts encouraging play into the middle of the table. Because at the moment, it's only dictated by whether you want to fight or whether you want to shoot. Which is all well and good, but it can lead to kind of negative experiences that can potentially put off new players, I would say. So if you're not building a list that's designed in such a way that you're forcing the enemy to come at you, they can quite happily just stay away from you and shoot you or dance around you or pick off your weak units. So it's not necessarily a very good early experience. If you have a new player and you say, the objective is we have to control this area in the middle of the table, and if you do that, you win the game, that's quite straightforward. You can get your head around that easily, and maybe even if you're not the best at figuring out which units are good at killing what. You can still do that. You can form a, a solid line, not open up your flanks, march forward into that area, and you've got a good idea of how that game should be played. So that's something I'm going to be keeping my eye on, whether GW go that route. I would be in favour of it, but of course I'm a Kings of War player, so I'm used to that kind of thing. Old school Warhammer players, this is just the kind of thing we've been dealing with forever, It's just kill stuff. And occasionally you'll have like a tower that gives you extra points if you hold that, which is what we've got in the old world. But this is another open battle. A 12 page FAQ on the way, apparently that I'm very much looking forward to. There's something that comes up in one of my games uh, that 
definitely, I think, needs a bit of an FAQ. Although I don't know whether it'll get one, because it's not... It's debatable whether it's clear or unclear. So, on to the next game. And this is a dwarf mirror match. And these dwarves, you can't tell just from this picture, but the paintwork on them, it's very impressive to me. And I'll explain why when we get a bit of a close-up of them. But you can see that they've got some rangers out there. And because I've got rangers and my opponent has rangers, we have to roll off uh, when deploying them. And... My opponent got to put some down first and put them right in my flank. So I had to put a unit of rangers down there to counter. But I'll take you through the list anyway, because it is quite different to my list, although there are some similarities. So let's crack that bad boy open here. So I'm going to analyze the paintwork on these guys as well. So here's a bit of a close up. Now, this is this is kind of the if we're talking about the beards. They are more natural colours than I use. So this is a far more gritty and modern looking dwarf army than mine is. Mine is very much classic 90s, bright orange beards, bright yellow blonde beards. This is much more realistic. The kind of highlighting is the kind that I've tried to go for on my dwarves. I think for the most part mine look pretty good. Uh, but these are obviously very, very nice, very, very clean very shiny but not in a gloss sort of way it, i think it's a, one of the specific silver paints that was used comes out in this really nice natural looking shine and there is highlighting going on as well it's not just a flat paint that's been used so very nice what they remind me of these dwarves is the kind of paint job i've said this about armies in the past in other game systems it's the kind of paint job you would see in a games workshop cabinet over the years like in the... when did they stop using Goblin Green, basically? From that point onwards, up to modern times, you go to a Games Workshop store, you looked in the cabinet, you would see something that's really clean and kind of like this. The eyes are very cleanly done as well. It's all just clean. It's not super crazy that's going to grab you from a mile away and say, yes, I'm going to go and look at that army. But it's very gritty, very clean paintwork, but it's it's got some kind of... it's got a bit of grizzle to it which is weird to combine with it being such a clean paint job. They just look very good. And I think it's a really cool contrast to see this slightly more modern style opposite my army, which is very much retro, nostalgia, 90s style, which I've given some highlights to modernise them a little bit, but for the most part, it's still classic looking. So it's cool to see the way paint techniques have changed over the years. And of course, my dwarf army was mostly painted around the year 2000. So the highlights I've given them recently have brought them up slightly to modern standards, but if I was painting them from scratch, I would do them probably a better paint job than they have on them now. These ones are just very cool though. Very cool to see. So what is in the list? Let's start back at this end. So we've got 10 hammerers and there's a small unit of hammerers and I am always wary of taking a small hammer unit because they just have terrible armor don't have very good hammer at all uh, let me see i think you can actually give them shields which helps them from not being shot to death but i don't think this unit has shields they have the rune of confusion which i think is the one that means when you charge them you don't get your initiative bonus which is it's another one i've considered taking on my hammerers the one i've gone for is the one that stops you having any special rules on the charge, so you wouldn't have impact hits or lances or anything that gives you like extra attacks on the charge. And then this is the one that takes away your initiative bonus. You can't combine them both onto one banner because they're too expensive because they are very powerful. So you could take one on a BSB and just make the unit not quite immune to being charged, but a lot of units when they're charging you, you would get to hit them first because you get plus one attack and initiative when you're being charged with hammerers. So you'd be up to initiative 4 when you're striking. So an awful lot of units in the game just would not want to charge you. Which says to me it's probably too much to put on a unit then. Because the enemy are just going to avoid it. And you're so slow that they're not going to be able to get you. So you can make the... You're not going to be able to get them. You can build the ultimate Death Star unit. But if it never gets to fight, its role becomes more limited. So also, one thing that impressed me about this army as well, these movement trays have got little handles on the back so they can be moved more easily, which is really cool and something I've not seen before. 
One thing I considered doing that was vaguely similar to that, I've considered at some point building a Kings of War army, because the way you have the units in that game, you don't take models off, you just stick them all to the base. The base is always the same size. And if you put a like a stick or something in the middle, you could then lift up that stick. And in Kings of War, you don't wheel, you pivot. So you just lift it and spin it round to pivot the unit. So I've always wanted to do something like that with the Kings of War unit, but I haven't thought about having a movement tray with a handle on it before. That's quite cool. We've got some Iron Drakes with a Trollhammer Torpedo, a mirror match of my units. Behind them, we have got a block of Iron Breakers. So I think these are the Iron Breakers. So there's 20 Iron Breakers and 20 Longbeards. So let me just look at the other unit. Yeah, so that's the Longbeards. I can tell because of the, like, the armor skirts they have are the same ones as the hammer models, because it's made from the same kit. And these are the Iron Breakers, which are from the Iron Drakes kit. My Iron Breakers that I have are the old 90s Iron Breakers, the metal ones. These are the more modern ones, but they do look very cool. And this might actually be the most impressed I've been by the modern Iron Breaker sculpts. I think it's just the paint job that's tipped them over the edge into that category. You can see the lovely freehand on the banner there as well. Very nice work. So what do those Iron Breakers have? They have... They've got full command, obviously, and they've got Cinder Blast Bombs on the Iron Beard Champion, so I think you can use that for Stand and Shoot. They have the Rune of Courage as well, which I believe gives them... What does the Rune of Courage actually do? I could go and look right now, actually because that could be quite interesting to know. Let me have a look. I'm going to try and go into one of my apps and build a unit and put the Rune of Courage on it, because there are a lot of similar ones. Is it the plus one combat res aura? That's what is suspected down there. Let me just see here. So if I add a unit of, let's say, hammerers to this list in the app here, and I have a look at my rune options. Let's have a look. Rune of Courage. Okay, Rune of Courage automatically passes any fear or terror tests it is required to make. There you go. So that is interesting because, so the Anvil of Doom has two enchantments it can use. One of them is that you can buff the armor save of a unit. What, the other one is that you can make all the units within 21 inches immune to psychology. If you want to purely use the armor one, because you can't do both because they're bound spells, then having the ability to auto-pass fear and terror tests is actually a useful option. Because then you don't have to rely on the anvil to do that job, so you can then use it for the armor buffs. There we go then. So, going back to the list here. So, on to... I think the BSB is in this unit as well, so let's see what he's got. He's got the Master Rune of Stromni Redbeard. And I think that's the one that has the Combat Resolution Aura. Which is quite powerful. There's the Anvil. Same as mine, except it doesn't have any of the upgrades on it, so it's a lot cheaper. But the Anvils are kind of just given free reign in this game because you have to deploy 24 inches apart so they can't dispel each other and they can't move so they can't move into dispel range so we're just going to be able to just sit there hammering away at the runes just willy-nilly without anyone to stop us then in this unit on the hill we have got the longbeards which isn't a unit i have i've sometimes run just dwarf warriors as longbeards in the past but if they bring back the metal longbeards, I would definitely get them. But looking at these paint jobs, actually, they're very nice. I'm kind of tempted to just go out and buy a load of modern dwarves to add to my classic ones now, seeing how they're painted in this army. But I would like some of the old classic longbeards, but there's 20 of those. They have the Rune of Battle, which is, I think, the plus one combat resolution banner. There's also two gyrocopters around here somewhere. There they are. So with the other Iron Drakes, two gyros. And they have the... Let's see. They don't have the same guns as mine. 
these ones have the brimstone guns, which are kind of the middle ground, the, the middling gun, so you can't move and you can't march and shoot with it, should I say, but it's got a longer range than just a template. So pretty good choice, two of them to my one. So I've got my rangers, one unit here. For anyone who's just joined, by the way, this is the final game where I'm running an illegal list with two units of rangers in my core. In the last two games, when I've, I'm informed that that is illegal, I mash them together into one big unit of 27 rangers. So, and I blame the old world builder app for not telling me it was illegal, by the way. So I've moved on to using new recruit app now, which seems to be much better at telling you when something's wrong with your list. So what is my strategy? Because I've got one unit of rangers here. And I'm hoping to have kind of shooting superiority because I've got skirmishers here and there. Uh, my opponent has, I don't believe, gone into skirmish mode out there with his rangers. So I should be able to start blasting away and killing some of these things. Um, hammerers and iron drakes. Uh, particularly the hammerers because they don't have very good armor. So I could shoot them off. I've got both my organ guns down here. The anvil. So all my shooting power that's got any kind of range threat really is focused on this side and my short range shooting the iron drakes is over here with the slayer between guarding my hammerers now i've got my where are my thunderers so my thunderers are up on this hill uh, which maybe isn't the greatest place for them but if anything does get down here to kill the rangers they are then going to start blasting and there are hammerers and that kind of thing over here. So hammerers and iron drakes. If they want to move up and do anything, the thunderers can start shooting them. My little dwarf warrior screen. Uh, they were one of the, the earlier deployments, which is why... Or well, when I put some significant things over here, my opponent then started putting more significant units over on that side by the hill. So we're fighting kind of mostly in this sort of area with our fighty units. My opponent is going to go first, so I'm going to get shot first. I definitely have the shooting superiority. My opponent has the same Iron Drakes that I do. I have more Rangers, but I also have Thunderers and Organ Guns, and an Engineer with a gun as well. And my opponent only has one more Gyro than I do. So I've definitely got the shooting superiority. Combat superiority is definitely on that side, though. There are three decent fighting units, two of them quite large. So, if it comes into a shooting match, I am quite confident, but we'll see. Going first, well, the anvil double ones with its first attempt at a striking of the rune in the t first turn. The gyrocopters are getting in position to drop bombs on my rangers, and they do actually kill some of them. So four dead rangers already, which is disappointing. And the enemy rangers start firing their crossbows and kill three of mine immediately but I'm going to get the chance to fire back. One thing my opponent did say is that he regretted not deploying a little bit closer, like one inch, because it would have stopped me doing this with my rangers, forming a solid line next to my hammerers. The Anvil of Doom. Well, when it strikes the runes, the Anvil of Doom is pretty tasty. If you roll a decent number of hits, and it just kills five Iron Drakes immediately before they get a chance to do anything. So that means that I failed all of the 6-up armor saves that I had after the minus 2 for the anvil. And I also failed the ward saves that I had for being... Was, was I within 6 inches of the BSB with that unit? I feel like I was. So I failed all those ward saves as well. So they're all dead. So that's disappointing. On to my turn though, and it's time for some sweet vengeance. So my rangers start blasting the enemy rangers kill four of them. Uh, this could go on for a while, they could be shooting each other for the whole game. And I start blasting away and kill one measly Iron Drake and put a wound on a gyrocopter. And three hammerers are dead as well, so that's good. They've already been moved by the time I took the picture, by the looks of it. So one Iron Drake from each unit, a few hammerers, and a wound on a gyrocopter. So a, a Definitely an underwhelming first turn of shooting for me there. And more hammerers are shot from the gyrocopter, which is cool. Into turn two for the evil dwarves now. We've got one gyrocopter charging the organ gun, the other one charging my little unit of dwarf warriors there. And the iron drakes 
start firing at me. And I don't think they do much in this turn. But we're down to three rangers now in this unit. They've been shot. My other rangers that are in the ranger on ranger action on the flank lose another two. So I'm quite confident here because they're in open order, which means they're not skirmishing, and I am skirmishing here. This combat, not much is going to happen there. I lose a crew member to the gyrocopter here. And my war machine is very, very vulnerable to this kind of thing, unfortunately, because I don't really have anything decent guarding them. I've got my slayer over there. He would have been a better choice to guard them than the engineer. So if I'd had the engineer a little bit further forward, the slayer here, he could have then attacked the gyrocopter. Turn two for me. So rangers on rangers, kill some more of them. And my iron drakes move out a bit. They've got the anvil's buff on them. And kill some more iron drakes, but still not enough. Kill some more iron drakes, but not enough. The gyrocopter moves behind the hammerers and then shoots them and kills some more. But not fleeing yet. My thunderers move down off the hill because they've realised the battle is not taking place here. We need to move towards the enemy if we're going to join in. So they're heading down this way. And that battle rages on there. So I've got one organ gun tied up so it can't shoot. I haven't really been peppering the main units yet. I'm trying to get rid of the iron drakes. Because so I need those sweet, sweet points. And on my opponent's turn, you can see that there is an advance on now. The dwarf units with combat intent are steaming in there. Now, they are clearly not as good at fighting as hammerers. But there are more of those units. There are two big units coming into my one. So we'll see. And I do have the shooting superiority, so I can understand why you would want to advance. The hammerers turn around to look at the gyrocopter, but obviously it can just flap over them and shoot them again. I'm down to one ranger at the moment as well, after being shot. And this combat is still rumbling on. The enemy rangers have a really good round and kill four of mine. So I've only got five or six left in that unit now. So I thought I was going to win that battle by having skirmish formation, meaning the enemies were minus one to hit. And... Could you ever get a more dwarf fight than this, just standing off each other, blasting crossbows at each other? No advancing at all, that's old school Warhammer tactics right there. And the enemy Iron Drakes, they decide that the Trollhammer Torpedo is actually a perfect choice to shoot enemy war machines because their toughness 7, when you shoot at them, the Tro Trollhammer Torpedo has a really good ballistic skill and it's strength 8. So it actually does some wounds to it. It's not quite dead though, thankfully. And my Dwarf Warriors are overrun by the Gyrocopter and it gets into the Thunderers, so that's disappointing. And the other Gyro is in a bit of a stalemate with my organ Gun crew. So, there is going to be some action coming up, some combat, surely. Turn 3 for me. So, my Thunderers end up falling back in good order and the Gyrocopter decides not to pursue them. Now, it's because it's their turn next, so the gyro obviously wants to go and charge something else, or get a charge in and do impact hits, perhaps. Or you could probably do that from following up, though, so they must want to go off and go somewhere else. This combat rages on. And I shoot off some of the long beards at the front here. And the, the gyrocopter fails to kill any more hammerers this time, which is sad. And I don't think I do a great amount to this unit of rangers. But I am sending my Slayer over there now to get him out of the way. So he wants to go and eat some Rangers. But really he just wants to get out of the way. Because I don't want the Hammerers to get stuck. So I've got the Hammerers quite wide. Behind the Iron Drakes. So if the Iron Drakes get charged and then there's an overrun. But a nice wide unit of Hammerers ready to murder this unit after the overrun. Because you do count as charged when you're overrun into. So turn 4 for the Evil Dwarves. The gyrocopter charges my final ranger, hoping to kill him and get a load of points for that. The longbeards charge into the iron drakes and they take two casualties as a result of the standard shoot. I just really like the silver paint. I can't remember which paint he said he used, but I need to ask because I like it a lot. Now, the silver on my dwarves, I actually don't like that much because in the old days, I was using too much black wash, too much like null oil or whatever the equivalent was back then. And that caused some of my old school units to have quite dark silver on them. Not these ones, because these are the more modern ones. These were painted about 10 years ago. 
these ones, they came out looking a bit on the flat side, I think, my silver. And I think it's because of the varnish I was using. I think at this period I was spray varnishing my models, and I don't do that anymore because I don't think it comes out looking very good. So I just brush on the anti-shine varnish now. And I try and get the shine achieved through highlights. I still think the iron drakes look very good. I haven't given them any touch-ups at all. I think that blue armor came out really, really nicely. Whenever it was, I painted them. It is about 10 years ago, isn't it? That they redid the dwarves. For the final time before the world blew up. The hammerers are running away from the gyrocopter, but they're really running away to try and get further away from my organ guns, I think. Ranger on ranger action causes a couple more casualties. And the iron drakes are killed. The longbeards do not overrun. Did I even mention that there's a king in this list? I think I may have skimmed over the enemy king, you know. Let's see. I'm going to go through it if I haven't. Yeah, I don't think I actually mentioned the king. So, he's got full plate armor, and three times rune of shielding, which I think is the really good ward save that's one use, I think. So, very tough to kill, is it looks like he's got a great weapon there, and he's in the Longbeards unit. Uh, yeah, I totally didn't mention him earlier. So, the reason not to overrun into the Hammerers is because if the Hammerers count as charging, then they get plus one attack which would be nightmarish, because Longbeards, they're decent at fighting, but the Hammerers with the ward save, I would expect quite a few of them to survive being punched by the Longbeards, and when the Hammerers hit back with multiple attacks, they would commit murder. So I am going to have to look into some of these chrome and really bright, vibrant silver paints, because I think they look really cool. I don't know what I'm going to use them on, though, I am starting work on my Bretonian army, so that could be something to look into there. That could be really cool. Really bright, vibrant silver on them. Because I'm going to do my Bretonians wild colours. I'm going to do even the Knights of the Realm. I'm not going to do them in any strict regimental colours. I'm going to do each knight its own heraldry, its own colour scheme. So a really bright silver might go really nicely with that. They'll be extremely vibrant. So I'm definitely going to look into that. My two iron drakes actually fled, so they weren't wiped out. So they bounced through my machines, and thankfully no one flees as a result of the iron drakes fleeing through them. And it's time to do some charging in my turn now. So the hammerers. Now, what I was saying before about going wider. I don't have much space to go wider on this flank, so when I change my ranks, I can only go like one extra on this side. And two extra on that side, because I think you have to do it around the center. So you can still go two that side, one that side, and that's the widest I can go, and that's what I do before charging. So go as wide as I can, and then charge in. And the Slayer charges into the flank. So the Slayer is actually contributing to the game, isn't that amazing? The Slayer getting involved. Rangers versus Rangers is still going on. I'd be surprised if they actually kill each other by the end of the game at this rate. So, the hammers have gone very wide, so they're not lost as many hammers as it looks like here, by the way. Because, let's see how wide they were. How many did I have? So I've taken at least three off to put on the sides there. So I've lost a few in combat, but not a huge amount. And I've killed some of the long beards as well. And even more of them. And there we go, so we've killed a decent number of long beards there. And did I even take a picture of the combat resolution counter? If I didn't, then that is... That's not great, is it? The organ gun is down to one wound. And you can see that the enemy's turn now results in them moving in with these iron breakers, which are obviously quite scary against a diminished hammerer's unit. And... I'm down to one ranger in this unit now. And yeah, the enemy units, on average, the skirmishing units should be winning this fight because I'm harder to hit, but it's not worked out that way. The enemy anvil then kills my gyrocopter, I think, which had flown down here to have a go at the iron drakes. There's still one of them left, gosh darn it. And even though organ guns and anvil and engineer have been blasting away, I just can't kill that last one. 
So whereas the enemy, Anvil of Doom, said, Hey, you, enemy Iron Drakes, you're all dead. How do you feel about that? Oh, too bad. You're all gone. I've been blasting away at the enemy Iron Drakes for the whole game, and there's still one of them left. So, obviously the Hammerers are reigning supreme in this battle, killing loads of Longbeards, not losing too many in return. And there is a challenge there as well, which is why I've moved one of my Hammerers around the back. And finally, the enemy Gyrocopter kills my organ gun. So we'll see whether... Uh, oh, actually, it pursues off the table. So it's gone for now, and then it'll come back on in a minute, I think. And on to turn five for me. So you can see that my surviving Iron Drakes will come over here to shoot up the enemy rangers a bit. And the Hammerers and the Slayer completely obliterate the Longbeards, so there's only one left in the unit which is denying me a load of points. So I need to chase down that guy and kill him, and the king as well. My anvil kills off, finally kills off the final Iron Drake, I think. And the hammerers are just running for the hills, and I can't finish them off, unfortunately. I think this is, this is my last chance to kill them, because they'll just move out of range now with the organ gun, and I killed one. Very disappointing. So, the slayer actually overruns. These guys don't. So, here is my thinking. This is quite a complicated situation. If the Iron Breakers charge into the Slayer, their overrun would get stuck by this guy, which would go into the Hammerers, which would mean that they would then be striking first against the Hammerers next turn. Which would be bad, because the Hammerers are down to their front rank, so any losses are going to mean loss of attacks at this point. And it's, yeah, it's interesting, because if they charge the Slayer in such a way that they line up here, which they can't, but if they could end up that way, which I think would be only if they rolled... There are situations where if you roll a sufficiently low charge, you end up in a position that's actually favourable because you end up with less models contacting. This isn't one of those situations, but if the Slayer kills this guy, which would give me loads of points for the unit, but that would mean that the Iron Breakers could then overrun the Slayer because they only have to charge him up to here to get the maximum number of models into contact with him. So if the Slayer kills him and then the Slayer dies and they overrun into the Hammerers. So it could be a weird situation coming up. So you can see it illustrated here, because that's the spot they have to be in to maximise the number of models in combat. So if he dies, suddenly the space opens up. If he doesn't die, then they're stuck there, which is kind of interesting. And the enemy gyrocopter getting behind my lines, don't like that. I'm trying to finish off these two units, no doubt. And the enemy anvil kills a few hammerers because they're not in combat this turn. And the Slayer does get killed, but does not take down the, the Longbeard champion with him. So, here's my dilemma now. Do I charge here? They are very likely to flee. If you flee, you go through your own unit and do not get caught. However, Dwarves have minus one to their flee distance. So... What could happen is that they roll a double one, meaning they only go one inch. So the king then gets stuck, maybe just in front of this unit, so that I would actually catch him and kill him. So there is a risk attached to doing that. I think this guy would, even with one inch, would bounce straight through them. But if they're the same unit, do they... They're still in the same unit, aren't they? Yeah, so that's weird. So I think they would just bounce straight through if they flee, which would then put me into the Iron Breakers. If they don't flee and they hold, they're protecting the Iron Breakers though for a turn. What would you do in this situation? So let's find out what happens. So I do charge in and they choose to hold and not flee. Now I think fleeing would have been a better choice there. I think it would keep them both alive. Yeah, this is on my turn six now, and I do actually kill the king in combat. And then this guy falls back 
or it maybe gives ground or falls back in good order, either way. And I do not follow up, because I don't want to contact the Iron Breakers. I want them to charge me, perhaps, and give me extra attacks, or maybe... Yeah, it's a weird... I can take that movement trait away now, surely. The enemy anvil... Uh, does it kill anything? I don't think so. I'm trying to see if any more stuff dies. Oh, look, we have got a picture of the combat resolution counter now. And a draw there. Uh, yeah, that's the end of the game. So I didn't have to worry about overrunning in, into the Iron Breakers because it, the game was just over. But I did kill the enemy king, but not the final Longbeard. So that deprived me of a load of points. So surely you would think that these hammerers charging in, doing the final wounds on the king, would also kill the Longbeard champion. But alas, they did not. And that denies me a huge amount of points. Let's see how many points for that unit. They are 303 points, the Longbeards. So I think, do you get a third of the points if you only kill under 25%? So maybe another 200 points if I killed that one model, which I can reveal as I look at the scores, I would have turned it from a loss for me into a win if that one model dies. Swing would have been that big. Would have turned it from a loss into a win. Not a draw, would have taken it into a win. So, that was a really good, really close game. Some units that are hanging on to life, preserving their points, including my Ranger veteran, by the way. Uh, so he's denying the enemy. How many points is he denying them? That's a decent nugget of points there as well. Let's have a look. The Ranger unit... Actually, I don't know because I changed my list actually because this list was actually illegal as I was saying because of the two units of rangers. So into the next game and day two. And this is where you'll see my rangers in one massive block of 27. So because it was pointed out to me at the end of day one, actually you're only allowed one unit of rangers in core. So I thought, what's the best way to address this? Do I downgrade the rangers into quarrelers for, for day two? Or I decide actually the best thing to do that makes the least changes to the list is to just mash them into one big unit of 27 rangers, which is perfectly legal, and I could have been running it like that the whole time with the models I had there. So how do I equip them though? Because if I give them all great weapons and shields, the list becomes too expensive because one of the units didn't have any upgrades. So I decide that to get it as close to 2000 as possible, I just give them all great weapons and take away the shields. So that's how I would have run them if I was fitting them in, with this many models. So I've kept it as close to the original illegal list as possible while making it legal. So now, I see a totally different role for this unit. Previously they were two medium sized units that skirmish and shoot at things, I'm now looking at them as a shooting unit that is also a really dangerous combat block. It's great weapons, and if you start running that really wide, that is actually very dangerous. And shooting on your Ballistic Skill 4 is pretty good as well. So, yeah, they just look pretty tasty. So I thought, I, I'll try them out in open order instead of skirmish. Just put them out in a big block, see if anyone wants to attack them. How about that? So for this round, I have my opponent's list just loading up here. And this is High Elves. So another new army, not played against them in the old world before. What are we up against here? We are up against two of uh, scouting units of cavalry. And these are, let's have a look, Illyrian Reavers. So that's 105 points for five models. They're skirmishers, just light cavalry with spears and short bows. So they scout and they skirmish. And they're of my scouting unit, my rangers, now formed into a combat block. I've got my two organ guns in the middle, hammerers next to them. Yes, the elves are very nicely painted as well. I'm not sure where all the models are from. I don't know if all of them are... Are some of them perhaps the... Are some of them actual High Elves, or are some of them Lumineth Realm Lords from Age of Sigmar? So it's a nice action shot over the top, pre-game shot. And these archers here, 
are Sisters of Avalon, so they're a rare unit choice, and they are pretty good at shooting with their bows. There's another unit of those somewhere as well in there. Now, this unit here, that is 18 Phoenix Guard, which people will remember Phoenix Guard from back in the day being quite a good combat unit. And they have a really good ward save against flaming attacks. So the Iron Drakes dish out flaming attacks. So that's something to think about. Then there is 19 Lothurn Sea Guard, which are the hybrid shooting and spear unit. So I remember them being quite good as well. So those two units are about 300 points each, those two big fighting units. They're good. There is a level 4 Archmage around here somewhere as well. I think it might be in... Is it in this unit or this unit? I can't tell. It's in there somewhere. The Archmage. I think it's in the Lothan Sea Guard. And there is a Prince on a Star Dragon as well. That's 492 points of flying, hard to kill toughness. Talisman of Protection, Pure of Heart, Seed of Rebirth. So, really good save, regeneration, ward save, all that stuff. The kind of thing that people are stacking onto the big flying monsters they can fly around and cause absolute havoc in the old world, which is the seems to be emerging as the meta right now. That can always shift, and if people start coming up with good ways of countering it, it, I think that kind of thing would have always been good in Warhammer if it weren't for cannons being so damn good with doing d6 wounds. So cannons were really what kept big monsters in check back in the day. And by in check, I mean it made them really bad. So terror geists would just be gunned down in turn one, guaranteed, if they didn't hide. And it wasn't... It wasn't what you wanted to see, really. It was obviously fun for a dwarf player to just kill the biggest thing on the table immediately, but people didn't take a lot of them because as cannons were a thing and you'd just die. So you weren't going to have fun doing that. But now, big monsters back on the menu, that's kind of what we want to see. People just need to have other ways to counter it. And the ways that we have currently, like the Trollhammer torpedoes, for example, doing their D3 damage, strength 8, like a mini cannonball and bolt throwers, not as long a range as cannon, and they don't do as much damage as the cannon used to. So a bolt throw does two wounds. So multiple bolt throwers is obviously a threat, but they do have not the greatest ballistic skill, and they'd be firing at long range. So currently the meta demands level 4 wizards, if you can take them, and big flying monsters if you can take them. There is a repeater bolt thrower as well. My gyrocopter has moved up. I'm eyeing up charging that repeater bolt thrower with a gyrocopter. I think that's a good target for me. Because the crew in combat will have a really hard time wounding this thing. And I'll do impact hits. And I think I can do a good job on it that way. Turn 1. So the elves go first. So they have a, a, a buff put onto the Lothan Sea Guard. And then a teleportation spell. Now this moves the unit, and uh, possibly the wizard, out of my dispel range now. And they were out of it at the start of the game anyway, because I have to be 24 inches away with the anvil. So they've now changed their setup based on this unit of rangers, which is a very strong looking fighting unit. So the Lothan Seaguard being over here means they've got more bows looking at the unit now. So they're obviously picking this unit as the unit to be killed. Oh by the way, if I didn't mention it, it's because it's mostly irrelevant. This bit of terrain in the middle is kind of what we're fighting over, allegedly. You get, I think it's 150 points at the end of the game if you're controlling it, which is, it's not totally worthless. It can swing a game, but it's really not significant as far as scenarios go. You're much better off trying to kill things and then towards the end of the game, if you've got the units nearby, then go for it. Or if you've got a unit that's put out of the game early because they're low on models, for example, and they could hold it, it's really more of an afterthought in the game, and it's just a big thing in the middle of the table to block lines of sight. So now that they've moved over there, that also, let's have a quick look at the wide shot again. So I'm going to just go back here. So my organ guns were hoping to shoot the Lothan Sea Guard, but now they've teleported away. And that's why I've put them here. Because I don't want line of sight to the Phoenix Guard, particularly because I'm not going to be concentrating my shooting efforts too much on them. And when they want to fight me, they'll have to come round the sides anyway. I want to shoot off the things that are more 
likely to be killed because like I was saying these guys got a ward save and it's even better against flaming attacks which the iron drakes have so my shooting attacks are going to be better focused if I'm going to focus fire into some of the other units like the sea guard early on I feel which is why I've got my gun line positioned here but now they've just zoop, teleported over to the other side so that's not very sporting of them is it tricky high elves with their sneaky ways the Illyrian Reavers are moving round to flank my rangers, which I'm not overly concerned about, but maybe I should be. Because I'm thinking, here come a lot of strength 3 shots that aren't going to wound me very much, but we'll see how it goes. The dragon decides, I'm just going to stand right in front of you immediately. Your gun line can have one turn to shoot me, and if you don't kill me, I'm going to eat things. Probably going to start with a light snack of thunderers or dwarf warriors following up into the anvil. That would be a, a good choice. Or we probably wouldn't want to charge the Iron Drakes because their standard shoot is very dangerous. But if you charge something over here, you can then be getting into the flank of some of my units like the Hammerers. Now, as I was saying earlier though, a big monster fighting Hammerers isn't ideal because I can just keep feeding it one guy a turn. And maybe if you're in the flank, that's slightly better because you're more likely to win the combat by a higher margin. So you're more likely to make the hammerers break but they do have shield wall and stubborn so they're quite resistant now the shooting is actually very powerful and look at all these dead rangers so i think i've underestimated high elf shooting there i think they just have good ballistic skill even though it's probably strength three mostly the repeater bolt thrower does some damage to the gyrocopter which isn't nice uh, did i mention there was a great eagle well there it is and it is a very large eagle so because this dragon is about to charge me, this round the anvil is going to be using its rune that's going to give me an aura bubble of immune to psychology. So no one's going to run away from the dragon. So that's what I do. And you can see I'm using this square based complementary front arc measuring device which came in our little goodie bags for the event at the TSN arena. And I do absolutely nothing to the Lothan Sea Guard with my shooting. And then I decide, you know what, this dragon may have a good save, but I've got loads of armor bane, and I'm going to try and kill you. So everything fires into the dragon, and I do one wound. Wow, wow, wow. So at, at that point, I then felt, really, I don't think there's much point shooting my final unit into the dragon, because I'm not going to kill it now. So I then just try and kill the eagle and do a wound to that as well. So all that, and I do two wounds during the whole turn. All these guns, all these crossbows, all these iron drakes, organ guns, thunderers, anvil of doom, striking the rune. All that, two wounds dished out during the turn. So obviously not good, but I did make a charge in on the repeater bolt throw with the gyrocopter. So that's a positive. Turn two for the high elves. And I think this is Plague of Rust taking away the armor save of my rangers with the spell. And the dragon goes for the juicy target of the thunderers, who do not get the standard shoot because it's too close. And he's obviously going to munch them. And the cavalry is surrounding my rangers still, which obviously isn't very friendly of them. And shooting them, and more are dying from the shots. And what's that? They're down to three, because they have no armor saves now. Well, and down to one, in fact. That movement tray is looking very lonely for old Joseph Bugman, the ranger. So more shooting takes down a couple of iron drakes on the other side. And my thunderer champion challenges the dragon to single combat. And he's going to get eaten and stepped on and overkilled, obviously. And then they fall back in good order and get pursued. So still holding them up. And now I've got the opportunity to charge. A dragon slayer into a dragon. So we've got some excitement coming. The gyrocopter is still battling with the bolt thrower for some reason. I haven't killed it. And what is my plan now? This ranger is just going to run away and hide and try not to die by the end of the game. So I don't give away too many points. I'm going to charge the dragon with the dragon slayer. And I'm going to start shooting and try and kill things. Obviously the organ guns could make potentially short work of these guys. But they are skirmishers. So it's minus one to hit them. However, this organ gun is at close range, so it does completely obliterate one unit. The other organ gun is at long range, so it would have been hitting on sixes, 
so I don't bother shooting the skirmishers. I just shoot forwards instead and don't think I do too much. The Thunderers lose the combat and the Slayer. So the Slayer got eaten and didn't get to strike, didn't do anything with his death blow, and then the Thunderers ran off the table. Wow, wow, wow. The dragon restrains and I think it turns as well. So I've given this unit of Iron Drakes an improved armor save from the Anvil because I feel like they're going to come under attack now because there's only three left. And the enemy are moving forwards a bit. My one ranger gets behind there with Plague of Rust still on him. That'll go away shortly though. And the dragon is now looking down my flank. So there's a very strange situation about to come up. See if you can guess what it's going to be. Here we go. Okay, first of all, the gyrocopter gets killed in combat by War Machine crew, so that is the height of embarrassment. It's toughness 5 against these puny strength 3, toughness 3 elves, and somehow it gets killed. So there's my dead pile at the moment. It's building up. And I've killed a unit of Illyrian Reavers, but not a lot else so far. I have killed a few of the Phoenix Guard with shooting, though, which is good. And... I think in the first turn the Phoenix Guard made about 10 armor saves successfully and then in this turn they just failed all of them that they had to take so some of them are actually dead now. Turn 3 for the Elves. So the other Illyrian Reavers charge into the organ gun. The dragon charges into the flank of the hammerers. What bizarre situation can you foresee coming up here? The Lothan Sea Guard chased down my ranger final lone ranger and <laughs> so the wizard Ed has a calamitous detonation in his own unit after a miscast and kills a load of them but doesn't wound himself though so if I was the wizard in that situation I would be feeling pretty guilty about now the spell that you've just tried to cast badly has blown up and killed a few of your best friends but you're untouched So they now are over here. I don't know if they teleport there with a spell, but if you're looking at this whole area, the strange thing that's going to happen is imminent. So two organ gun crew get killed. The eagle charges into my five dwarf warriors. So that's going to be a fun fight. Now then, you may notice that the hammerers are now here. They have not teleported. So the strange situation that came up is after combat against the dragon, the hammerers fell back in good order, which means that they go through units and bounce away. They do not stop. If you fall back, you would stop here on the organ gun. And because of the stubborn rule, I did have the option of falling back, which would mean I stay there and fight the dragon because I can't really reform because the iron drakes are in the way and there's all kinds of stuff around here. Not a lot of space. I could stay there and feed the dragon one hammer at a turn and hope I don't fail my leadership test because I'm still going to be hitting the flank and there's going to be lots of overkill each time. So I decide instead that my hammer is really my only unit left that's going to kill anything and these phoenix guard, or are they? No, they're the Lothan Sea Guard. They are a prime, juicy, succulent, tender morsel that I want to kill. So if I fall back in good order, instead of doing a break test, then I would teleport through these units and end up here. Just flee through them and end up there. Yep, yeah, so it's very strange. Now, it is true that they have to take a peril test to see if they lose a wound from going through an enemy unit. So this is not some super master strategy. This is kind of a last chance. This unit is going to be stuck there fighting a dragon until they eventually die. Or maybe I can kill a unit. So that's what I'm thinking. So even if I lose half of them, I still think that's enough to kill the Sea Guard. So it's a very weird situation. Very weird how that works. How you bounce through units when you're fleeing. Thematically, it does kind of make sense how you'd be running and scrambling past them. But it doesn't make a lot of sense that you would be facing in this direction. Which I think, fall back in good order, entitles you to a reform at the end of it so obviously I would want to be facing this way because I can then charge the enemy so yeah because it's my turn next so I'm going to be able to charge them now which is really weird so we'll see how many of them die from taking the peril test but 
say for example they weren't there, and you have a really long line that gets flanked, you fall back in good order and just bounce through your entire army. Very, very weird. And I don't know whether the rules writers would intend it to be that crazy. It's a rare situation that's going to come up like that, but it will happen. So it's good to know that that's how it actually works. If that's incorrect in some way, then I'm sure there will be comments to that effect. So, one of the organ guns, as a result of the hammerers fleeing through them, fails a panic check and runs away. And because it flees, it automatically dies because it's a war machine. Then the hammerers lose, we haven't got to the picture yet, there's the dragon pursuing. The hammerers then lose seven of them. The BSB takes a wound as well. So, even though that was a semi-disaster, the organ gun got killed, and I lost a good chunk of this unit, I'm now in a great position to go and murder those sea guard. And as it was, I was just going to be stuck there. So I'm not that disappointed. The dragon is also now out in the open for me to spin round and troll hammer torpedo it in the face with two Iron Drake units. That's three. Let's see here. Gilthos says, interesting that fall back in good order pops through, but give ground does not. Yes, I can understand why. I feel like give ground isn't supposed to be you actively moving away from the enemy. It's more like you're being forced back just a little bit. I like you just taking a step back, a tactical step back to get your bearings a little bit. Whereas, fall back in good order, you are actually fleeing, but at the end of it, you are recomposing yourself. I think that's what it represents. So if you're not fleeing, you're not kind of picking your way through the models in a different unit to get through. So I think that thematically does kind of make sense. So fleeing or fall back in good order, you are actually running away from the enemy. But the difference is, with fleeing, you're continuing to run away, and with fall back in good order, you're then, when you get to a safe distance, you're then thinking, right, we've gone far enough, turn around, and let's face them again. I think that's the difference. So I think it kind of makes sense. So, onto my turn. Let's try and murder some stuff. The hammerers charge into the sea guard, and we're going to hope to kill a load of them. The eagle and the dwarf warriors are continuing their epic battle. Uh, the other organ gun gets killed. I turn round and I do th a few more wounds, so I've got three wounds on this dragon now, with my troll hammer torpedoes. But every time I fire both of them, I think when I fired them in the first turn, actually, at the dragon, one of them rolled a one to hit, one of them rolled a one to wound. In this round, one of them rolled a one to hit, but the other one did actually do some damage. So that's good. Two wounds. So it's up to three now. Combat resolution. Look at this. Beating the sea guard and... They fall back in good order, and I follow up after them, I think. Which takes me further away from the dragon, which is what I want. Onto the high elf turn. So, my engineer, I think he's actually charged by the dragon, but fails his terror test, and runs away, and dies. So that's nice for him. The Hammerers get rear-charged by the Illyrian Reavers and flank-charged by the Sisters of Avalorn. Now, I am actually crazily not too disappointed about this, because these are not hard-hitting units. And they present an easy target, particularly for my BSB, who isn't very good at fighting. He doesn't really have any kind of nasty weaponry. So he could just kill three of them and get some nice combat res out of it. Now, they do gain some for attacking in the flank, but you only get one for a flank charge, and I don't think they're going to hurt my unit. And I think the BSB is going to punch three of them to death, possibly. So that might actually be a net negative for the High Elves doing this bit of the charge. The rear charge, not so much, because you gain two for that. And these guys could possibly kill something. So let's see. Because the hammer is also count as charging this turn. So they will go at the same time as the unit in front, I think. At the same time as the Sea Guard. So the other units will get a chance to kill some first. Let's see. So, it's a bit of a bloodbath. Look at that. So, most of these guys are dead. A couple of them die. And the Hammerers actually win the combat because I do so many kills. So I kill most of the cavalry. The BSB kills a few of them. And I kill a load of these guys as well. So... Here's a really interesting point. 
The hammerers charged last turn, or they count as charging. The enemy then charged them, which means that they get the bonus for charging to initiative, and they also get the bonus for being charged and get an extra attack, which is wild. So, uh, let me have a look at the hammerers rules. I think the the banner that I've got requires them to be charged in the front, but if they're charged, they just get an extra attack. So the fact that these two weak units charged into them just gave all the hammerers two attacks each and the champion three. So that's kind of what made it a worse move than just giving me free combat res by killing them. So that's why I was able to do a billion wounds, kill a ton of stuff, and yeah, that ended up not being a great maneuver by the high elves there. But obviously we're all new, we're all learning these things. Once people have faced hammerers a few times, they will know if you charge them, they are getting a billion attacks, so watch out. So turn four for me. The Iron Drakes to do some more troll hammering of the dragon, and we've got it up to six wounds, so we may actually kill this thing at some point. <laughs> the last warrior and the eagle keeps being pushed back each time, closer to the anvil. And the hammerers charge into the remaining sea guard, hoping to finish them off. And, yep, don't do it. So into the next turn, this guy charges into the hammerers again. And the dragon also charges, but I don't think the dragon reaches them. I think it's one inch away, which is very important. So then in combat, I then murder everybody's face, apart from this last guy who's running away. And that's going to be points for the cavalry, but not points for him. So I need to kill him before the end of the game to get a load of points. And the eagle's still fighting. I'm doing more shooting. Onto my turn five, though. So the eagle kills the dwarf warriors. The troll hammers do not kill the dragon, sadly. And the dragon is then able to charge me. And we've just had a very kind donation in the chat there so you know what I'm going to hit like on it and see what that does there you go I think that's a new thing they've added I don't know if you could like donations before but thank you to Gilthos and obviously if you want non-stop action non-stop battle reporting tournament reporting action from the old world and various other game systems that just flow directly into your eyeballs and your ears via the internet then why not pledge your entire life savings to me which will give me like infinite tournament tickets admission price. Sounds like a good plan to me. So the dragon does make it after my hammer is in this turn and the phoenix guard are just hanging out by the tower to get the bonus points because they're kind of out the game now. There's nothing for them to do because everything else has been so wildly successful. This guy runs away to preserve his points and the dragon is gonna hopefully mop up this unit. He's gonna try to. I can challenge him to a fight and then be overkilled but I'm still likely to run away off the table sadly. The bolt thrower that's still alive, I don't think I actually damaged it with the gyrocopter, you know. Shoots down a uh, an iron drake. And more shooting kills off more iron drakes, and I think that unit's just dead. And the other unit, because the iron drakes near them died, they then fail their leadership test and flee. And on to my turn six. So, the iron drakes roll a ten on the leadership again and flee off the table. So nothing even attacked them. That's how brave they are. They just saw some other Iron Drakes get killed and run away. And then when they tried to rally, they also ran again. Now, I did make a mistake here because the Anvil is right there and that's my general in this army. So I think I could have actually re-rolled that test. But I didn't remember at the time, so they ran off the table. Then. Okay, this is also hilarious. So. The Dragon. Challenged by the Hammerer Champion only does two wounds, the dragon. It has a really bad round of combat. Then I roll 11 for my leadership test, and then I roll 12 with the reroll. So I run off the table despite only taking two wounds. So I, let's see, what was the combat result there? So the dragon has a rear charge, which is two, and did two damage. So that is four, probably close order, so five. I'm close order, banner and BSB, so three. So I'm down by two. So hilariously, I fail both leadership tests and run off the table and die. Let's see. 
Also, they didn't need to roll panic test as the unit destroyed wasn't unit strength 5. If they'd failed, they'd have only fallen back in good order, good order so they're only over half strength. <sighs> yes, so that's another bit of the rules played incorrectly. So that's going to be good to know going forward as well. So, I ha yeah, I have been playing it correctly in that if the unit takes damage and they are still above half strength, they don't flee. I think I've been doing that correctly. But being set off by another unit, that was played incorrectly. So they should have just fallen back in good order because they're at, they're not above or below half strength. So yeah, you can't cause a chain reaction of units running off the table. So they should be alive still. And by all rights, after that round of attacks from the dragon, they should get another chance to live, but no. So that's going to be the end of the game. And that is obviously going to be a loss. That didn't go very well, so where did it go wrong? Uh, the rangers, I don't think, did anything. It was the first time I'd run them in open order as a big block, and I should have just put them somewhere else. And, yeah, that wasn't a great spot for them. Could have done something totally different with them. Used them more defensively, perhaps. And... The teleport spell obviously took the enemy out of range of all my dispelling for the whole game. And their shooting was just much better than I expected, and my shooting was very underwhelming. I barely did any wounds. Too many misses in the first turn, then the dragon was able to get in. And the hammerers did a good job, they got some kills. Other than that, very underwhelming game for the shoot, the shooty units of the gun line. So it's a 15-5 loss. Now, at lunchtime on day two, and all the armies were out for display, for voting for the best army, I took some pictures of them all. So, let's have a look at them all. We've got some lovely vampire counts here with a giant zombie and so these models I, they're not official mortis engines I, I'm gonna assume they're probably 3d printed just very similar knockoff type models got some nice zombies and some ghouls in this list as well these are very nice ghouls where are those ghouls from because Annie my housemate who runs Bad Squidow Games, for the record, has lots of ghouls in her range, but she also has the largest collection of individual ghouls that have been released. That's not counting 3D printed ones, because I'm sure, like, anyone could have a 3D print of a ghoul up on their, on their website now, in STL form, but actually produced as miniatures. I think she's got almost every variety of ghoul that's ever been, like, one of each. So not the largest collection of ghouls, but individual ghouls. So these ones are pretty cool, wherever they're from. Yeah, so she's getting her Vampire Counts army ready with lots of ghouls, ready for the old world as well, so she's going to go to some events at some point. We have got some Beast Men, which are great to see. We love to see Beast Men. One of the more characterful armies of the old world, I feel. Very nice paintwork on them. I like the, the dark blues. They're very nicely... Highlighted and shaded. Very nice indeed. On to some delightful... Look at that. Tomb Kings. So Tomb Kings I would expect to be popular along with Bretonians at the moment since they were the armies in the starter box. Necro Sphinx, one of the cooler models from the old 8th edition days. Skeletons, regular Skeletons, nice to see those. I like the Tomb King skeletons because they don't have too much armour. Armour on a skeleton, I feel, takes them away from the best skeletons of all time, which are the Jason and the Argonaut skeletons. So you just want mostly a naked skeleton with a shield and a weapon. That's what I like in my skeletons. It's a very cool army there. We've got some Skaven, who are not... They're one of the renegade factions, if you will. One of the legendary non-official factions, kind of. So, nice to see the old classic Skaven out there. I don't think there's any Storm Vermin in this army, but the, I think the Storm Vermin might be my favourite Skaven models. Elpet Abomination. I remember that thing being a nightmare to deal with in 8th edition. And I think the thing that made it so difficult was the fact that it, it did it come back to life when you killed it. So even if you cannon it off, does it then come back to life? I think that's what it does. We've got some elves. These are the ones I just faced, obviously. So very cool dragon. 
I'm a fan of the old world style dragons, so if they, for example, were to get the Wood Elf Forest Dragon on like a made to order, I'd be very tempted to get one of those, even though I have no intention of doing an army. We've got what appears to be more Beasts of Chaos, which is cool to see. Very, very colourful. Very, very purple. Very, very cool. We've got some Bretonians. Now, these are very nice. These are another army quite similar to the Dwarves that I was praising earlier. Very, very clean. Very, very nice. But also not bold. So the kind of army I like to see on the table because it's a nice contrast to the kind of armies that I like to bring with very, very bold, exciting colours like my Dwarves. So very cool. Very grim and cold looking but very, very nice. And it's kind of inspired me. I should probably start painting my Bretonians because I've got loads of them. I bought loads of them at release, including some of the made to order stuff. I've got like the green knight. I've got some grail knights, questing knights, all the cool stuff. But I've been busy preparing my dwarves for the old world by highlighting their beards and giving them eyeballs and highlighting their clothing and also waiting for the Dwarf release, but I do have a bit of time now, so I think I may paint some Bretonian units. I'm not even assembling them until I've painted the previous unit though, because I don't want to get a massive backlog. So very cool Bretonians. We've got some Orcs and Goblins, with Mangler Squigs, a Wyvern, a load of Squigs, Snotling Pump Wagons, which are the Blood Bowl Pump Wagons. Very cool. And Fanatics. Obviously, I've had one game against Fanatics so far, and it did not end well, so I know how powerful they are. We've got some more Vampire Counts with, looks like, two Terror Geists, some Knights, some Direwolves. I actually do have a full Vampire Counts army that I can use in the Old World, because I had, towards the end of 8th edition, I it's mostly Mantic models because I got a load of Mantic Zombies and Skeletons to use as the infantry, so they're all individually based. I have used them in Kings of War as well, as Undead. So I can do a Vampire Counts army at any time. I've got Dire Wolves, I've got Knights, I've got a Mortis Engine, I've got Crypt Horrors, I've got some Heroes, I've got Bats, all the good stuff. But no, uh, no Terror Geist, no Zombie Dragon though. Actually, that's another one that would get me. If they ever brought back the the old metal 90s zombie dragon, but not the horrible green paint job that they did on the art, on the official pictures, the really nice white paint job. I think you can still see that in the Warhammer World Museum. I think they've got the one in there that's painted kind of white, kind of bony colored. That one's really nice. The 90s zombie dragon, look that up, very cool. Then we've got some Empire, Steam Tank, Griffin, Demigriffs, cool stuff. Let's see, and more pictures of them. And we've got some Chaos Dwarves. So there's barely any units here, but look at that. Blunderbusses, the really exciting war machines. Now, I do like Chaos Dwarves after playing them. Well, I always liked Chaos Dwarves, actually. The old models I really loved. I have an Abyssal Dwarf army for Kings of War, which is the Mantic equivalent of Chaos Dwarves. And I'm actually going to be using that twice this weekend. I've got two Kings of War tournaments coming up at the weekend. So that's going to be fun. If you're a Kings of War fan, look out for the tournament reports on that. But the Chaos Dwarves, I have a, a new appreciation for the more recent Chaos Dwarves, the, the ones that Forge World made after playing them in Total War Warhammer 3. Their war machines were just so deadly. And often in Total War, you feel like when you auto resolve a battle, sometimes actually it can do way better than you would as a general. However, with the Chaos Dwarf war machines, I really wanted to play all the battles myself because I just loved staying back, blasting with the obscenely long range Chaos Dwarf big cannons just obliterating half the enemy's army before it gets there. And that was just a lot of fun. I am a Gunline fan, if you hadn't guessed. Then we've got... These are the dwarves that I've taken some even better pictures of here. So you can see them in all their glory. 
Uh, this dwarf king here, I just painted mine actually, or I added on to the old paintwork, so it doesn't look as nice as this because I've been going over my old paint job. But you can actually see these close-up pictures, the actual silver highlights that have gone in here. So it's not just a very shiny metallic paint, there are actual highlights that have gone on there. And it's the kind of highlights where where you get really, really close zoomed in, you think, what's that colour doing there? And then you pull back and you think, oh, I get it. It works. So you have to have some good painting skills to know precisely where to put the, hi to put the highlights. So up close, uh, it looks weird when you're applying them, but then when you hold it at arm's length, suddenly that's where it should be. And to know where to put those is a whole skill in itself. We've got some more High Elves by the looks of it here. And these are definitely Age of Sigmar models used as High Elves. We've got some more Vampire Counts with big blocks of skeletons. That's really cool. I think that is an official Mortis engine there as well. And yeah, there it is with the legendary Necromancer himself, old Heinrich. Very cool. I used to like the, what was it called, the Fear Bomb back in the day uh, with the Vampire Counts where you would take the spells to like reduce enemy leadership and then put all fear causing units on them and then like scream at them with their lower leadership and then put them against skeletons and get them to fail their leadership or fail their fear test and then you, they're down to weapon skill 1 I think back in 8th edition so that was a thing that existed back then We've got some ogres on round bases. I assume they've got some trays as well that aren't in this picture. But nice to see ogres out there as well. Always cool. And some more beastmen. So wild we're seeing so many beastmen. You know, I really like beastmen ever since the White Dwarf series of articles. The, I think it was the original Tale of Four Gamers they did. Where one guy did the beastmen and... They just look really cool, and they were kind of the underdogs because he seemed to build like a way less efficient army than everyone else, and spent money on things like conversion parts, so just had less stuff in the army. And Beastmen have just never been a particularly strong army, at least while I've been playing. In fact, when I was playing back in the day, they weren't even their own army; they were just part of Chaos. And then when they split them out into Beastmen, Beastmen, and Chaos Warriors and Demons, before they were warriors of chaos when they were just chaos warriors uh, that's when I started my chaos warrior army so I didn't get the benefit of having beast men in the army but you could have dragon ogres in the army so I did have a dragon ogre the old metal ones not these ones let's see apparently beast men were very strong back in 6th edition according to visibly Riley nice it's good that they had some time in the sun I never really played against them back in the day I just admired them from afar and there's the Warriors of Chaos army that I played against earlier, which is very chunky Chaos Dwarf style models. And we're on to the last game. I'm against Orcs and Goblins, so the Squig Heavy army. And what kind of fiendish plan have I got on my sleeve here? Because I've already lost heavily to Orcs and Goblins in a practice game. Obviously my list is different now. So I'm going to go through the list. Let me pull it up here. Okay. So let's go through the Orc and Goblin forces. We have two Mangler Squigs, which have random move. So the reason a random move is scary is because Iron Drakes can't stand and shoot even at point blank range against random movement because it's not done as a charge, it's just a movement before the charge, so you can't declare charge reactions. So I can't do any standing and shooting against them. And looking at the list here, Mangler Squigs are only 95 points actually, that's very cheap. But then again, they do only have four wounds, so I can kind of understand that. Then we've got a Wyvern. So this is a Blackhawk Warboss on a Wyvern with Trollhide Trousers for regeneration and 322 points so it's probably not going to be as scary as one of the big dragons but still significant flyer we have two units of night goblins one's got a shaman in there and the other one's over here so the shaman let's see what he's got that is that's going to be 
a level four wizard with warg magic and the two night goblin units uh, the two of them with 19 models in they have netters and they have three fanatics and they have full command so the fanatics are very scary because they just pop out whenever they want kind of at the start of a turn and then they move in the direction you want and then after that they move randomly so you, you don't you can't be baited into it well, you can kind of, but you still make the choice. It's you that's being baited, not the unit. Back in the day, it used to be whenever you moved within range, then the fanatics would fly out automatically. So you could send a chaff unit towards them and bait the fanatics out that way. Now you have to kind of tempt the enemy to bring them out by putting something there that's worth their time. And even then, they don't have to send all of them out at once, I don't think. So what else have we got in here? There's a goblin boss in here as well. Night Goblin Big Boss, which is... I think it's on a, a squig over there. Yeah, that is on... No, there's one on foot, actually. And then there's one that's on a squig. So the War Boss is on a squig. A giant cave squig. And there's a big boss that's on foot, and that's the Battle Standard Bearer, which is in... It might be this wizard, actually, that's the Battle Standard Bearer. Or is it this guy? He might be the BSB. That weird guy in the middle there. So I think, yeah, there is a wizard. And, or is that the BSB? How am I supposed to know these things? Okay, I think that is the BSB, actually, because I think the actual standards in the unit, uh, the, that would be him, presumably. So I think that's the BSB. So what does he have? The battle standard bearer has got the banner of butchery. And I don't know what that does. There are two pump wagons, five squig hoppers, who are skirmishing, and a big block of Black Orcs, which is very scary. They are very tough, hard-hitting unit. And let me see how they're kitted out. So 15 of them. They have full plate armor, which is good. They're stubborn. They have additional hand weapons for extra attacks as well. And hold on, it's the banner of butchery that they have, unless that's a common item and another unit has it. Let me see. The Night Goblins. Oh no, one of the Night Goblin units. Oh no, yeah, it's just the Black Orcs that have that, not the Goblins. The BSB has the big red raggedy flag. There you go. So yeah, these pump wagons from Blood Bowl are very, very nice. I've still got a soft spot for the classic early 90s pump wagon. Not so much the one that came between that and this one. I think I prefer the early 90s one or the Blood Bowl one. So, what's my plan? The gyrocopter out on the flank. Black Orcs don't want to, want to spend their time chasing down the gyrocopter, so it's really there to get in their way or dance around them and maybe block things up. There's a lot of random movement here. I haven't talked about that squig herd, actually. I think that's the last unit I haven't mentioned. So, there are... I think it's two squig herds. Or maybe they're just one herd that are just down in the list as two units. I think it is just one big block of a squig herd there. So it could just be a mistake in the list. So my plan. Shoot them to death. I've got my gyrocopters in the the forest, which is dangerous terrain. So if they want to come in here, they're going to have to take the test. Got the anvil in there. So this is my classic setup, it seems, with the engineer in there as well. Hammer is on one side with the, the iron drakes in front and my little chaff unit on the other side with the slayer. And the thunderers on a hill looking in. My rangers in their massive block are over on the other side, staring down the two mangler squigs. So I think this massive wide block of rangers in open order, so they can all be in the fighting rank, firing off like 15 shots into the enemy is going to be great. And then in combat, when they get charged as well, they will be able to hit back and do some serious pain. So let's see. The random movement is indeed random which is why you'll see these units having vastly different uh, places on the table so the two manglers moving into range i put my rangers in a position where if i went first i would be able to shoot but it's right at the outer limit of their range so now i've got 15 wide here so i'm going to be able to shoot with 15 shots into one of them and try and kill one before i get charged over on this side the black orcs moving up behind the squig hoppers and the goblins are being fairly hesitant the squig herd is rushing out in front, and I think if the squig herd breaks, then it kind of explodes and does damage to nearby units. 
So let's see what happens. Oh, we've got a nice action shot. This is the last time you'll ever see the Anvil crew, or the, the Rune Master and the crew, with golden horns. I'm actually going to paint those in bone colour, those horns, when I put it on its new green base. So enjoy looking at the gold while you can. I'm doing all the horns in the army as actual horn coloured. It just adds a bit more variety. And there it is. So onto my turn. So turn one, the gyrocopter moves up into the flank and guns down, or tries to gun down, some of these guys. But I don't think the clatter gun actually does anything. The, an the organ guns and the anvil actually do some good stuff though and clear out most of that unit of squig hoppers. The thunderers and the iron drakes do a load of shooting as well and they clear out a massive swathe of the squig herd and I think I'm about to sneeze. It was two sneezes, in fact. So, you're glad I was quick on that mute button, or you would have all been deafened horribly. So, loads of dead squigs. So, that's good. The rangers blast away and get this guy down onto his final wound. Which isn't as good as you would normally think, because if you put something onto its final wound with one of the dwarf ranged units, you're thinking, you dare not charge me because my stand and shoot will just kill you. But, these things don't allow stand and shoot because they have random movement. So... Cleared out most of this unit, but one alive is still a danger. I've put my Slayer up there. I've put the Anvil's armor buff onto this unit because I feel like they're going to be targeted by something. If one of the pump wagons rolls high, it'll get into them. And then I treat these guys as a big threat rather than the pump wagons because they might not reach me yet. Turn two, and the Squig Hopper, the last one, goes into the Gyrocopter. And what's this? The two Mangler Squigs come up just short in their charge, or their attempted random move, into the Rangers. Isn't that so sad for them? One inch away. So that means I'm going to ha either have another turn shooting it, or, even better, I might be able to charge it. Because that way, I can overrun, if I kill it, which I will, into the second one, and then deny it its impact hits by getting it tied up in combat. So that sounds like a good plan to me. Look at this, this is full on line hammer here. 15 rangers wide, blasting away their crossbow bolts, and then getting ready to wield their great axes as well. So being forced to mash them all together into one big unit of 27, due to the illegality of the previous list, has kind of forced me to rethink how I use rangers, because this actually seems quite scary as a unit, just as a block that that can be deployed close to the enemy. So the goblins do drop a vortex down because they're still out of dispel range of the anvil. So that's going to be blocking line of sight to this unit and blocking line of sight from maybe my war machines into the wyvern who's come down off the hill as well. So the gyrocopter kills the final squig hopper in combat but does take a wound. And let's see. These squigs have moved up. They're the snotling pump wagons move a disappointingly short distance. The Black Orcs are getting dangerously close though, so I'm going to have to start focusing on them a bit. And my next turn is going to be Operation Shut Down the Random Movement Impact Hits by preemptively charging everything. So the Rangers are going to charge in there. The Gyrocopter gets behind the Black Orcs and I think does a bombing attack on them. Then all my shooting, what does it do? Whittles down some Black Orcs, kills a few of them. My rangers kill the mangler in combat, and then overrun, but don't quite reach the next one, sadly. And I did lose three in the process, so killed one, so that's good. But I'm within two inches, which means there would be no impact hits. However, what I was discussing with my opponent is that it is actually possible for a random mover, even if it's really close, to still do its impact hits, even if it only needs to move three inches or more than three inches. Because since you're moving randomly, you're not actually going straight into the enemy. You can just turn and go like all down here and hit them there. And then that is this, then treated as a successful charge of like eight inches. So you then get your impact hits. But my opponent was saying, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it that way. I think that's a bit cheesy. I don't think it's designed that way. So that might be one for an FAQ. 
or maybe an errata, because as it is now, you can use your random movement to like move around and get into enemy flanks. You can use it if it's... I don't know if you can like jump over them, but if you could reach, you could get around the back and fight them that way, and it just counts as a charge if you hit them. Because you're not moving necessarily in a straight line with random movement, that's just how far you can go. So, I think my opponent is correct in that you would think that intent would be the distance between the two points. But then, if you're touching down there, that is how far you've gone. So yeah, maybe they would make a change where it's if you're your random mover, the distance between that and the unit that it eventually contacts at the start of the move, that is considered the distance you moved for purposes of determining whether you get your impact hits or not. That could be something to look at. But my opponent isn't going to do it anyway, just I told him it's fine, you can do it, and he just didn't want to do it. Too sportsmanlike. I've buffed up my Iron Drakes because I feel they might get attacked by something. And I've blasted away more of the squigs. There's actually one squig left in the unit and then some goblins herding it. I charge my dwarf warriors into the snotling pump wagon. We've got Stu in the chat. We've got Valros blessing me for that earlier sneeze, so thank you. Good evening, Stu. Are you dabbling in the old world? That'll be interesting to know. Because it does take you about ten years to get an army ready for anything, it seems. So I expect to see you on the old world battlefields sometime in the early 2030s. We have got turn three for the orcs and goblins. So I've got the pump wagon tied up there with the warriors. So that's not a threat at the moment. Black orcs are a big threat, obviously, but they're slightly outside of charge range of the thunderers still. And I've got my slayer waiting for them just in case. So the wyvern charges in to the rangers. And the Mangler smashes into them as well. So, I am not sure if I would have gone this direction. Because these rangers are 15 wide. If you, let's say with these two monsters, if you kill half of them, the attacks coming back at you could still feasibly kill a Mangler. So I would be tempted to just run away from the rangers and not bother with them at all at this stage. But if you're confident you can do enough wounds... Let's see, Stu says, how dare you, sir? You finished four 40k armies in the last three years. So you're really good at finishing armies for the one game system that the world doesn't care about, or at least the world on this channel. This 40k hasn't really grabbed me, although I have been sorely tempted because those new Dark Angels are very nice, but there's too many game systems. Not in terms of playing, because I would happily play 40k. It's just in terms of buying more models, I just don't have unlimited funds, unfortunately. And since dwarves are coming soon, that's going to be a big, big wound to my wallet as well. I've got loads of Bretonians keeping up with my Kings of War armies. I've uh, backed the Mantic Epic Warpath Kickstarter as well, so that's going to be fun. And The Walking Dead has been re-released as well, so I'll be spending money on that. Okay, so how do we think this combat's going to go? We'll find out shortly. By the way, I'm going to tell you now that throughout this whole game, we both entirely forget that we have hatred against each other's armies. So we do not do any hatred at all during the whole game. Which I guess you could say benefits me, because the dwarves are mostly shooting and the orcs are mostly in combat. So they would really like to have some hatred. The squig herd, it's not really a herd, it's more like herders and then their one pet make it into the organ gun, which is not nice. And the boss on the squig and the pump wagon are fighting these five warriors. But you can see that comically, uh, the pump wagon and the war boss lose. And the war boss falls back in good order all the way back there, I think. So I think if you fall back in good order and you have random movement, does that mean that you use the random movement to do it? I don't know. Uh, yes, only the night goblins have hatred. Yes, that is an important thing to clarify. Some of the units, like the Black Orcs, do not have hatred. I don't know about... I don't think the Wyvern does. Does the Mangler? I don't know. As the Black Orcs march up, and they're now in range to attack the Dwarf Thunderers. So, visibly, Riley. While Dwarfs hate all green skins, only Night Gobos hate Dwarfs. 
I would say that is actually fair. As weird as it sounds, it sounds like imbalanced in favour of the dwarves. But the dwarves are mostly shooting anyway. So unless you run a heavy combat dwarf army, in which case the enemy can choose who to fight because you're so slow. So I would say that is kind of balanced. Because the dwarves mostly want to shoot you to death where hatred doesn't apply. So I could have had a lot of re-rolls. Combat resolution. The rangers lose a few models, but not many. This, this wyvern had a horrifically bad round of attacks. And we draw the combat, but I have a musician in this unit, even though it doesn't look like it. So, I think that's... is that actually a musician there? I can't tell. Or it might, might just be the pattern on the table. But there is a musician in there somewhere. So I win the combat. The mangler's dead. And I pursue after the wyvern, but don't catch it. Yes, random move. Whenever a model with the special rule moves, for any reason, roll the dice to determine how far it must move. Yes, so even if you fall back in good order, you still move your random distance. So it's my turn next. This Black Hawk unit is a danger, but I do have a million guns pointed at it. Maybe not the organ gun that's in combat, but everything else. So, in fact, that organ gun's dead, and they overrun into the engineer, so they can have a good time fighting him. So this unit that, by all rights, should be dead. Look at that, there's only one squig and all the goblins poking it forward with their sticks. Then they're now onto an engineer. So the fanatics are out. Fanatic towards the Iron Drakes doesn't reach them. Fanatic towards the Rangers doesn't reach. And the other fanatic rolled a double and just killed itself immediately. Let's see, Stu says, fair play, there's never enough time and hobby funds. No more 40k armies for me. My project this spring is Old World Norse skins. That's going to be interesting to see. What miniatures are you using for that? Yeah, I would really love to get the new Dark Angels. And I will do one day, because Dark Angels are my 40k army, and I think they look very cool, the new Terminators. So I'd love to get another Deathwing army in the new extra tall scale one day, just don't have the funds. We've got Annie from Bad Squiddo Games in here, who did get a shout out earlier as being a, a ghoul fanatic, as we were looking at some very nice ghouls. So... Let's move on to my turn now. So I'm going to... This thing is actually running away, by the way. It didn't fall back in good order. It's fleeing. The model just hasn't been turned around. So my rangers are going to try and charge this guy. I'm not really thinking I'm going to catch him. I'm really thinking that if I charge him, he then flies away. Because the bows are... The crossbows are probably not going to kill him. Because he's got some... He's got regeneration. He's got a really good save. So I'm just going to charge him, make him fly away even further, so he's really far away from me. That's my plan. So, what's this? Black Orc's been shot to bits by all my guns, and then ran away like cowards. So the models aren't facing the right way, but they should actually be fleeing right now. Because they have suffered enough casualties to actually... Have they suffered enough casualties to actually flee? Or have they just fallen back? Is it under 50%? At the point at which you can flee from taking damage. From shooting, I mean. So, the, the Dwarf Warriors are continuing their attack into the Goblin Warboss on Squig. Yes, Stu, the new Belial and Scaled Deathwing are really nice. I was sorely tempted, but I would go bankrupt if I buy them right now. Especially with Dwarves on the horizon. And we've got the gyrocopter. So the gyrocopter, who's that going after? Who was there? Let's have a look. I'll go back. So the gyro, okay, here's what happens. The gyrocopter charges this pump wagon. So this is a really fun, bizarre situation. I can only really show it you from this angle as well. So charge the pump wagon. The pump wagon loses combat and flees. The pump wagon goes through my unit and does some peril tests and ends up here. The gyrocopter pursues and rolls high enough, flies over my unit, runs it down, and stops there. So, here's the weirdness about it. If you pursue, you pass through your own units if you can fly, and then you land on the other side. But if my pursuit had clipped an enemy unit, I would then go into combat with that unit instead. I wouldn't fly over it. 
you pursue with a fly move over your own units, but not enemy units, is how it was ruled at this event. So, if I'd been in combat slightly more upwards here, and I'd overrun, and I'd clipped this pump wagon here, I would then be in combat with it, and not been able to finish the pursuit, despite being a flyer. So that is really interesting, and it's something for people to dive into the rulebook, I'm sure, immediately, and look into that. Because that is crazy. Let's see. Riley says, well, you do take your panic test from 25% casualties, which is what happened since it was shooting. Yes, but can you full-on flee if you fail that panic test? If you've, only, if you've not lost, like, 50% of your unit, or do you just fall back in good order? So maybe that's what happens to the Black Orcs. But they do seem to go quite far, considering it would potentially have been a fall back in good order. How much do you have to lose before you can full-on flee from shooting damage? So, yeah, that angle with the pump wagon led to a very interesting situation that we had to check on to see who got touched first, whether it was the other pump wagon or my dwarves, who I could fly over but not the enemy. So flyers pursuing, at what point do they count as flying and at what point do they get stopped by the enemy? Very interesting nuance of the rules. So, go back to where we were. So the gyrocopter ends up out in the open after the successful pursuit. The Iron Drakes move up and do some shooting. The Hammerers are just re-angling themselves, really, for anything that's coming this way. And this combat is whittling down my Engineer's wounds. He's on one wound. And I do some shooting into the Goblins who haven't unleashed any Fanatics yet, I think, and take a few models off that unit. And... Hold on. This picture isn't loading so you know what that, I'm going to class that as technical difficulties and bring up the episode thumbnail for a second and look why my pictures aren't going further got them open as like a slideshow so let's close that and find where I was in the game and open it again okay that should now be working. So, where were we? Just zooming back here. And I think we're in the right spot. There we go. Technical difficulties immediately resolved. Look at that for technical wizardry. So what I used to do for these battle reports actually was load the photos into the broadcast software and play it as a slideshow in there. But when I started taking really in-depth pictures of all the events, it was like hundreds of photos and it just wouldn't load. And then they started limiting how many pictures you could put into a slideshow as well on the broadcast software. So now I'm just screen sharing one of my monitors, which is housing the photos, which I'm just scrolling through on my computer, which is much easier and less resource intensive than the old way for anyone who's thinking about doing battle reports. So there we go, combat, murder, and I keep either drawing or winning combat against these, against these or these goblin models because they don't have close order and the dwarf warriors do. Now, at what point do you not get your bonus for close order? Is it when you're down to the last model? Visibly, Riley says that's what I used to do with PowerPoint. Yes, so. I would say if you're going to do battle reports like this, having two monitors is very beneficial. So my gyrocopter has actually moved away. I think I fled from a charge from these goblins, which is why it's down here. I've, I think it was a fire and flee. And my iron drakes have a spell cast on them, so they are now stupid, which is fun. And the Wyvern, which rallies, flies over the top of the rangers so it can get involved in the game again. Which is probably a good choice, because if I turn around to shoot it, I'm going to be on minus two to hit. And this guy falls back again, which is funny. I just keep winning the combats against it, because it's just terrible at fighting this thing, it must be. Or just rolling really badly. The Engineer's down. So this unit that I thought I'd killed ages ago is now steamed through an organ gun and an engineer and it's into the anvil 
So surely the anvil can kill three measly goblins and a squig. And the slayer also attempted to charge into the flank of that unit as well, but failed the charge. So to get stuck just outside the terrain. On to my turn though. So I'm going to be able to try that again. The fanatics are released in my turn, so they're going to be steaming into my units if they can make it. And let's see where they go. Uh, they don't move yet, actually. But there's something else happening first. I'm declaring a charge with the gyrocopter to get out of the way of the fanatics, because otherwise it's just going to die. So charge into the goblins. Then the fanatics come out. They pass through the iron drakes, but they do not reach the hammerers, crucially. And they wipe out the unit, though, so that's quite nasty. And the other one doesn't reach anything. The iron drakes rotate a little bit. And my shooting completely blasts away some more Black Orcs. And after killing the Gyrocopter, the Goblins overrun into the Iron Drakes, which isn't ideal, and that's just a little mistake on my positions and angles I had there. So we've got some Fanatics out in the open, which can totally swing a game on their own. And this unit of Goblins, which, as feeble and pathetic as it is, could win a load of points for the enemy here does two wounds to the Amble of Doom and only loses two back in the process. Can you believe this madness? And the Slayer failed its charge again to join in. This is outrageous, as Anakin Skywalker might say. The Dwarf Warriors defeat the Goblin boss again and push him even further back. And on to the Orcs and Goblins turn five. So the Snotling Pump Wagon runs off the table because it's so terrified. The goblins charge into the slayer. This combat rages on. That combat begins. And where are the fanatics? One of them passes through the hammerers, I think, but doesn't do much. And the other ones either slam into the building or does nothing. So disappointing performance from the fanatics. The black orcs are moving in for the kill, but there's not many left now. So much so that the movement tray has actually been removed. And I think I don't think these two guys deserve to have their own movement trait. Although, to be fair, they are performing well, so maybe they do deserve it. Maybe that was harsh. You can see that I did turn my rangers round previously as well and had a go at shooting the wyvern, but didn't do anything to it. My dwarf warriors chase the goblin warboss on Squig off the table as well, which is hilarious. But then even more hilarious, the Anvil of Doom loses in combat, is killed by a goblin and a Squig. Pathetic anvil. So that anvil is like 360 points with the upgrades I've put in it. So this four goblins made it into my lines and they've taken out about 500 points of stuff here. So I'm definitely gonna, if I face this army again, there's definitely a grudge being issued against this unit of goblins. So there's my dead pile. So the points are stacking up actually for my opponent. Uh, this guy overruns, and the squig actually dies while overrunning through dangerous terrain. So, the goblin is alive. So while he's alive, that means I'm not scoring full points for that unit. So I'm going to have to try and murder him. The slayer takes a wound. The iron, the iron drakes are killed, so the goblins overrun into the hammerers, but they're obviously going to get whomped to death. That may be why they don't get to keep the golden horns. They don't deserve them. Being killed by a goblin with a pointy stick and one squig. That is very disappointing. Now the wyvern moves as well behind here. And onto my turn five. So I've got one more chance to kill the black orcs and I'm going to do some serious blasting. And the hammerers kill and overrun the goblins as you'd expect. The rangers move up a bit, but don't quite get any decent shots away on the wyvern. Killed some good black orcs, not killed any of these guys, and the slayer is still in combat with the goblins. Orcs and goblins turn six. The black orcs fail their charge into the organ gun. They don't roll high enough, so they're stuck, and that's lucky for me. Slayer still in combat with these goblins, and when we get to my turn, the black orcs get shot to death. And that is how we're going to end, I think. Oh no, the Slayer does eventually get killed and overrun into the organ gun as well. So, the last guy with the symbols there, he is still alive, so I don't score for that unit. One of the Fanatics is still alive, I'm not sure which unit he came from, because that denies you scoring as well. 
Stu is really loving the plethora of Old World content. Yes, I'm playing a lot of games of Old World at the moment. Uh, so there's going to be lots of battle reports. It's the hotness at the moment, obviously. It's getting a decent number of views compared to some of the other game systems. And I really mostly want to play lots of games just to learn all the rules. Because I'm learning... I think I learned that I was playing a rule incorrectly after every single game so far that I've played of the Old World. So eventually, people are going to have the rules nailed down. I certainly don't have every single one embedded in my brain yet, but I'm now at the stage where I've played probably about 10 games of Old World, so if I go and read the rule book cover to cover now, I will be able to fully absorb all of it. When I first bought it, if I just read the book cold, it just wouldn't stick, because there's no context. But now that I've played games, and I've seen the rules in action, I'll be able to read and think, oh yes, that's that rule there, and that's why that behaved that way, and oh, I did that bit wrong, it should be like this, and it's going to stick much better. So, yeah, that's going to be the end. That's the end of the tournament, and I do end up winning this game, but it's not a huge win, because that that pesky unit of goblins did eat through 500 points, which would have significantly changed the score. But I do get the points for the Black Orc, which is really big, and that's really what won it, finishing that unit. So it's a 12-8 win against the Orcs and Goblins. So, a really good win, one pretty bad loss, two borderline draw losses, and then this game, which is a, a decent win. But we had lots of funny moments in this game. We had Mangler Squigs being killed by Rangers. We had a very tiny unit of Goblins just running riot through Dwarves in dangerous terrain and killing them all. We had Black Orcs uh, not doing anything, just getting shot to death. And we had Goblins on Squigs and Snotling Pump Wagons being chased across the table by four Dwarf Warriors, who were supposed to be a sacrificial screen, but somehow ended up surviving the whole game. And killing multiple units so that's wild that they managed to survive and commit murder so what do i think of my list i think this gun line is actually more fun than gun lines used to be i really like the drilled hammer unit the rangers being run as a massive block is something i may toy with more a massive block of wide rangers you don't have to worry about restrictions on your deployment area because you just deploy them forward put them in a big long line and in open order, so if the enemy charges you, you get to fight with the fighting rank, and if they don't, you just get to shoot them. So that sounds like a really good choice, and it fills up a big block of your core requirements as well. The Thunderers are also in core, as are the Dwarf Warriors. Quarrelers don't seem to be as worth it as Rangers do, unfortunately. They've got lower ballistic skill, and their the cheapness of them I don't think is balanced out, because they also don't have the scalped ability either. Organ guns I think are underrated now. They are expensive, but I really like them. The 30 inch range strength 5 hits at long range I think is really good. It's got good armor bane, good for chewing through tough, slow moving enemy units, and also being a threat to flyers as well, who are generally toughness 6, or some of them are 7, but the toughness 6 ones in particular are worried about organ guns. Iron Drakes are probably... Well, would they be the strongest unit in the Dwarf list at the moment? And the problem is with organ guns, they compete with more Iron Drakes for a spot in the rare section. So I think this list... Let me have a look at my list here. I'll pull it up and tell you how many points of rare I used. I used 432 of the 500 point rare allowance. So I wouldn't even be able to afford another unit of Iron Drakes in this list unless I dropped an organ gun. And... I really like the organ guns. I'm going to sample the other war machines in more detail, though. I'm going to put them out, give them more testing. I'll have to try a double cannon list as well, which is easier to do because they're under special, so they're not competing with iron drakes. Uh, they're only mostly competing with hammerers, iron breakers, gyrocopters. Gyrocopters are definitely an MVP of the lists as well. Not so much mine, because I've only got one. But when they re-release those, I'm definitely going to pick up one or two more of those because they're a fun unit and they give you a bit more flexibility flying around the table you've got speed which is something dwarves sorely lack and something that i would like to get from miners which is hassling enemy units at the back i don't feel like there are enough units at the back that can be hassled because as, as soon as the miners come onto the table people just walk away from them and they can't catch anything 
So if we enter a big war machine meta where people are just bringing cannon lines, then miners could have their day. But until that time, I don't see a good use for the miners, unfortunately. Rangers, I think, are very good. So rangers, gyrocopters, and iron drakes seem to be the hotness at the moment. The anvil, mixed opinions people seem to have on that. I really like it. If the enemy wants to come into range to dispel your runes, which are powerful, then that also means they're in range for you to dispel their spells. And you can put all kinds of extra uh, dispelling runes on there as well. So I, my anvil was actually 320 points because of the upgrades I put on it. So it's expensive, but it's good magic deterrent, and it forces kind of forces the enemy to stay further away with their wizards, and that limits the spells they can use on you. I didn't really suffer much as a result of magic at this event, and I think the threat of the anvil is quite big, shutting down spells quite well. Uh, there were one or two vortexes that went off, but most of them weren't game-changing. Yeah, so I didn't feel the full force of magic, except maybe with the High Elves when they teleported a unit with it that was kind of game-changing. But other than that, actually targeting my units, I don't feel like there was a lot of it coming at me. A few fireballs, but they didn't really do too much. So I think magic defense is quite good, because if I stick around mostly by the anvil, then they have to come closer if they want to use some of those more powerful offensive spells. Overall, I think I had five fun games. Hopefully all my opponents had fun as well. I think they did. I don't think the gun line caused anyone to have a miserable experience, which is a good sign, because in 8th edition, a dwarf gun line would cause some people to basically fall into a deep depression during the deployment phase. I remember when I went to Adepticon with my dwarf army, as soon as I put down two organ guns, one of my opponents looked like he was about ready to... Not necessarily jump off a bridge, but throw his army off a bridge, I would say. So, it's it'll be good if gun lines are a competitive choice that aren't overpowered, that lead to fun games. And I think that having the big flyers less vulnerable to long-range shooting is going to keep gun lines in check a little bit and keep the games fun. Because your big flyers are very unlikely to be shot off in turn one now. So you are going to get them in. And if it's too much of a gun line, once you get in, you'll just mince through all of it. So I think that'll keep the games interesting. As long as they don't make cannons better again, I think that will stay the same. And if you take multiple war machines to try and get replicate the same effect, then you're also increasing your chances of rolling a misfire, uh, since you're probably not going to take a ton of different engineers for each one to buff each one, and ruining them all up gets them really expensive, so you can't take that many of them then in that case. And even then, they can still do very little damage. And positioning that many war machines with line of sight gets tricky as well. So I would like to try a multi-bolt thrower list at some point, but I currently only have one. So that's probably going to be one I'll buy when they bring that back out. Are they going to bring it back in resin or metal? Because I never got the more modern bolt thrower. Mine's the old wood-looking one. So I'll keep an eye out for that. Right, I think it's about time to wrap this video up, because we've been going 3 hours 8 minutes nearly. So I think that's decent for a first Old World tournament report. I don't know how many of them are there. How many are there out on the internet? Old World reports of all the games from a tournament in intimate detail. This could be one of the first out there. So, don't forget to like the video obviously and subscribe and check out all the links in the description to the various social media shenanigans. There's Twitter, Facebook group, Discord server, and all that good stuff. And, obviously, if you want to keep this stream, this torrent of content flowing, why not pledge your entire life savings via Patreon or PayPal? Or just send, like, get a little bundle of money, wrap it up in a rubber band, and tie it to the foot of a homing pigeon, which you can send to me as well. And I'll gladly accept any of those things, which will then fund all my tournament adventures and probably buying more armies as well because we all know that's where everyone's money goes eventually it's just into more armies and since dwarves are next on the horizon i'm definitely going to be buying the new king on shield bearers because that's a really cool model definitely going to get a load of slayers the goblin hewer probably another bolt thrower a couple of gyrocopters if they bring back the long beards then i'm definitely going bankrupt because i'm going to need a unit of those if they bring back the old metal ones 
and then if they bring Chaos Warriors back anytime soon as well, I'm probably going to dive on that bandwagon as well. <sighs> so it's a tough time to be a wargamer. There's a lot of things out there competing for limited funds. So maybe I'll just have to start selling body parts. What's the market like for kidneys these days? How many old world armies do you think you can get for a kidney? I'll look into that actually and I'll report back in the next battle report. So, I think at this point, thanks for watching everybody. Thanks for the donation that I had earlier as well. It's been a packed house throughout, plenty of likes and interaction with the audience. And all that remains to be said is, until next time anyway, good night out there, whatever you are.